Good evening. Um, I'm Chuck Souls. I'm the Assistant Director of MSO, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, tonight, um, this is the Transportation Commission study session. It's an hour long. Um, tonight, our topics are to receive some information on regulations for electronic and motorized vehicles and receive a request from VORI to amend bike share contract to include e-scooters. Um, Derek Rogers, our Director of Parks and Recreation, is here, and I might let him have a few opening comments. Okay. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, Dave asked me to step in and provide some comments. This So what I'd like to do is go over just a little bit for the first part on the uh, update on the, the regulations. And I think Dave sent you a memorandum and I'll just go through some highlights of that as discussion items or as presentation items. Um, the background on June 4th of 2019, the State Commission referred a request for VO Ride Inc. to expand the bike share program and implement e-scooters to the Transportation Commission for review and recommendation. Staff received a subsequent request from a representative Bird and also um, bring e-scooters to Lawrence. So the day you will hear from both uh, presenters from Veal Ride and from Bird. A little bit of background on regulations of e-scooters. The state of Kansas recently passed Senate Bill 63 regulating the use of e-scooters which are defined by the bill as every self-propelled vehicle having at least two wheels in contact with the ground electric motor, motor, handlebars or brake, and a deck designed to be stood upon while riding. The bill amends the Uniform Act to prohibit any person from operating an e-scooter on an interstate highway, federal highway, or state highway. The bill permits the governing body of a city or county to adopt an ordinance or resolution further restricting or prohibiting the use of e-scooters on public highway streets, sidewalks within such cities and counties. Uh, considerations um, over this process and discussion by the Transportation Commission. Uh, should the city solicit an RFP to select one vendor or multiple vendors for micromobility, bike share, e-scooters, e-bikes, etc.? Should a pilot program be implemented and what should the time frame be? Should the city partner with KU if it is uh, decided that uh, e-scooters will be part of the pilot program. Should the e-scooters be allowed on sidewalks? Should they be allowed downtown? Should there be age requirements, helmet requirements, speed restrictions, time of day restrictions, etc.? Of note, I have highlighted and, and brought some of our current regulations, ordinances uh, regarding bicycles and skateboards. Article 7, 702, writing on sidewalks, 702.1, hereby finds that the use of coasters, roller skates, skateboards, roller blades, and other similar devices hereafter it called a device is a public nuisance on the sidewalks and public parking lots in the downtown area, set forth in section 17.702.2, um, which basically states the downtown business district area. It shall be unlawful for a any person to ride, skate, or use a coaster, roller skate, skateboard, roller blades, or other similar devices on sidewalks in the area of Jayhawk Boulevard from West Campus Road to 13th Street, 1,000 feet on either side of this corridor in the University campus. So both, if it's decided that this is something that we want to um, proceed with allowing or adopting our pilot program, uh, these are some of the ordinances we will need to consider an e-scooter is considered an electric vehicle by the Kansas State or by the State Traffic Ordinance of Kansas. Um, motorized skateboard is also listed as electric vehicle. We do have an ordinance, 17216, which defines basically a motor vehicle, motorized vehicle. The intention when this ordinance was written was a gas-powered. I believe there may be gas-powered uh, skateboards out there. This is mainly dealing with electric vehicles with what you're looking at today. 
Are there any questions on the existing ordinances or regulations that I can expand on or? So essentially at this stage, um, there are no ordinances or regulations for personal electronic vehicles in wards. Is that? The e-bikes. The e-bikes. And we follow the Kansas State, um, or the Kansas State Traffic Ordinance, and Maria can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, um, which allows electric vehicles up to 1,000 watts and 20 miles per hour. Pull that up. And that's an e-bike. So these devices can be used in there. If you look at the electric scooters, based on the Kansas Standard Traffic Ordinance, they are not permitted on highways. Okay. And traffic regulations applicable to bicycles apply to e-scooters. But essentially, it's up to the city jurisdiction to do anything further than beyond what the state has done. Correct. We also have Maria Garcia here from our city attorney's office if you have questions with respect to ordinances or laws. Okay. Maria, did you have anything to present or? No, I Okay, thank you. At this time, um, we have, I believe it's Spiel Ride first up to present. Spencer, were you the do you have your device in or recorded? It's already in testing. Perfect. Spencer did something for you, right? Okay, so we in Lawrence pride ourselves in being a progressive city. And one of the ways we continue to progress is by reducing the amount of single occupancy vehicles on our roads. Uh, it's unnecessary emissions. So not only can those emissions from vehicles be reduced, but also the rate of traffic accidents. In 2017. Can you introduce yourself, who oh, you are, yes. who you're with? And I am because this has been televised, so it's of very course. important. And, and please, everybody speak into the microphone so we can hear that. So I am Spencer Dickerson. I am a Western U.S. Regional Manager for VO Ride. Uh, we've had a bike share in partnership with the University of Kansas and uh, the city of Lawrence here for about a year now. So the state of Kansas had... Uh, just under 59,000 reported car accidents in, in 2017 that resulted in 461 fatalities. That's uh, roughly one death per every 19 hours. Lawrence is roughly 3.5% of the population of Kansas, so we can reasonably assume that roughly 2,000 of those accidents and 16 of those deaths occurred here. Um, Parking is often seen as an issue here in Lawrence. Uh, personally, I don't think that parking is an issue here in Lawrence, um, but it is uh, certainly something that's perceived. So some of the problems that we can help reduce, uh, unnecessary actions, uh, uh, accidents, unnecessary emissions, and uh, parking cluttering. So there was a case study that was done in Portland in 2018 regarding a pilot program for scooters. The pilot included several companies with 2,000 total scooters between them. During the pilot, they saw over 700,000 rides with over 800,000 total miles ridden. It's an average of roughly three rides per day per scooter and an average of 1.14 uh, mile uh, round trips. 61% uh, of uh, Portlanders viewed the pilot positively and those demographics were higher for people under 35, people of color, and people with incomes uh, lower than $30,000. 
71% of users said they used the scooters as a form of transportation, not just as something that was fun. Um, less than a third of the riders said they used it for recreation. 34% of the residents said that they would have uh, used a single occupancy vehicle otherwise, or that they would have driven otherwise. So that was 19% uh, with a single occupancy vehicle and 14% saying they would have uh, hailed a rideshare or taxis. Visitors were higher than that, where 34% of them say they would have hailed a rideshare or taxi and 14% of them would have driven a single occupancy vehicle. <coughs> so out of 1,000 residents and 1,000 vis uh, visitors, that's 820 fewer vehicles that were on the road. Why veal ride specifically? One, we don't need to set up our operations here. We already have established operations here. Uh, we have a, uh, we've already established the local infrastructure needed to maintain a fleet of scooters. We have a local team that, with the addition of scooters, would be able to be tripled in size. We have a multimodal fleet, bikes, e-bikes, scooters, that all work off the same app. And most importantly, we have a far better and safer scooter. So the CDC did a report in Austin um, on scooter accidents. And what they found was that 50% of the total injuries that incurred from the accidents were at least partially attributed to poor road condition. The next highest cause of accident was 19% due to sco scooter failure, brakes, wheels, etc. During the study, every company in Austin used the same scooter model, a nine bot. The nine bot is a traditional scooter use, a traditional scooter model used by just about every other scooter company. This is a consumer product that you can find on Amazon for around $300. The wheels are seven inch hard rubber tire wheels and, be, and the rear brake is a step brake. The only other brake aside from that is an electric brake. So that's um, you know part of the concern of uh, that 19% of scooter failure, brakes, et cetera, uh, could easily be attributed to an electric brake. I've ridden a lot of these in other cities. Um, I've, I've no noticed that they uh, that switch becomes less reliable as the fleet ages. And the throttle switch being less reliable isn't necessarily a big concern, but the brake switch being less reliable is, is a huge safety concern. Louis Louisville, Kentucky did a study with public information after Bird launched and found that the scooters were lasting on average 28 days. This is a comparison of our scooter to the Ninebot much wider, larger platform. We have a field swappable battery in that large base. It's also larger wheels. 10 inch vacuum tire wheels instead of seven inch hard rubber wheels. So if we think about that 50% of accidents uh, being attributed to rough road conditions, this is one way that we can, uh, that we can really help alleviate that, that large number is by having, building a more robust, safer scooter. Some of the operational plans that, that we would bring. So um, I would want to bring 150 scooters here to Lawrence and KU, uh, that being on a staggered launch. So we would launch 50 at first, and then with demand, so long as scooters were being ridden at least four times per scooter per day, we would increase that number up to 150. We would reduce the size of the pedal bike fleet by 100 so that we have 150 scooters, 150 e-bikes, 150 pedal bikes. We donate the pedal bikes that we've reduced from the fleet to low-income communities and set up reduced speed zones in certain uh, potential problem areas. So one of them that I would want to put a reduced speed zone in is all down Mass Street. We've got a lot of traffic there. We've got a lot of um, angled parking there, people pulling out without necessarily looking. We can reduce the speed uh, of the scooters that are, are riding in that area down to eight miles an hour. That greatly increases reaction time. Uh, on top of that, our scooters have front and rear mechanical brakes, not electric brakes, so that they're, they're much safer to be ridden. They can stop uh, much more quickly and much more reliably. Thompson, let me interrupt for a minute. Um, Steve, the, uh, we offered five minutes presentation to each of two companies. Okay. If we were over that threshold, I don't know where he's at in his presentation, but if you want him to wrap it up, we should probably yeah, can do I, so. I'll take it from here. Okay. I, I, yeah. I missed that. I would say, too, to clarify, and Chuck and Jerry, help me out here. We're not picking between VO and Bird here today. We're not. That's not why we're here. I'm not we're suggesting. Here, yeah. We're here to listen about your product and more of the social aspects of this, if you want to call sure. it. Sure. But this is not a, you know, Correct. Uh, any kind of uh, 
competition. So, so. I, only, uh, I only brought up the name Bird specifically because it was that one Louisville, uh, Kentucky um, uh, um, study uh, that was specific to Bird. But okay. the, the nine bots are generally across the board of other companies. It's not just Well, Bird. Spencer, why don't you wrap it up as quickly as you can? And so if I would suggest one thing, uh, I, don't, I don't mind that uh, VeoRide would be among other scooter companies here in Lawrence. What I would suggest is that Lawrence demands a better scooter and that if other companies are to come here, that they should have uh, front suspension, they should have mechanical brakes, they should have 10-inch uh, wheels instead of 7-inch wheels to help alleviate some of those concerns that we've seen in the CDC report. It would make sense to me to have questions for Spencer before we go to the next. Sure. Um, I, th so I think if the board has questions, yes. Yeah. I think you want to do public comment all at the same time. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, questions for Spencer? You mentioned you could reduce the speed on Massachusetts. You can do that. Scooter specific? We can, yeah, scooter specifically, we can do that uh, in any place, in any zone, in any area. Can you also limit the area that the scooters can go? Yes. Yeah, we can have uh, no ride zones as well. What we tend to see when there are no ride zones is that uh, scooters will kind of accumulate around the edges of that <laughs> sure. no ride zone. So there are unintended consequences that come with that, but it is a possibility. So it sounds like the scooters are mechanically more robust. We um, build ours from the ground up to be a safer, better product. So yes. I would assume that they cost more up front as well and maybe more to maintain simply because they have a longer lifespan. How would you compare the costs and are those passed on to the consumers that are using the scooters? The costs are not, pa yeah, those costs are not passed on to the consumers. Uh, we, we keep our prices at the industry lowest. Uh, that's a dollar to unlock and 15 cents per minute. Uh, generally, that's the lowest that you're going to see anywhere in the country. That's You'll often see much higher than that uh, other places in the country. Uh, we, we sometimes go higher than that, up to 20 cents per minute, um, depending on profit sharing. So if we are offering the city 10 cents per ride uh, paid out on a monthly basis, then our prices might be uh, 20 cents per minute with a dollar unlock fee. Mm -hmm. to put in some technology to make sure that a scooter is parked where it should be parked to end a ride? So the scooters, the scooters do have much better GPS than the bikes. Um, uh, bike GPS, the, the, um, like it, it has to go through the user's phone, the user can close out the app and then it's not accurate. Uh, scooters, it's a little bit different, it's constantly being updated, so um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, essentially, essentially the same force parking areas that you're aware of uh, could be much uh, more accurate for scooters. I just have one. I think sure. back, back to Nick, and I think Charlie had a few too. The Portland study did not get into detail about accidents. If you were going to compare that 120-day study to cars and the deaths and those statistics, it would seem to be apples to apples that you should present that same information. Do you have that information? So certainly, uh, the Portland study was uh, more around just how it went, how the pilot went as a whole. They didn't have a whole lot of ac uh, information about accidents in general. The CDC study was uh, based around accidents as a whole. What they found was that out of every 100,000 rides, there were 20 accidents. None of them resulted in a death. Uh, the accidents that they reported were accidents that uh, a, a user went to, uh, went to the emergency room. It could have been small things that was a sprained wrist up to uh, larger things. I think there were one or two cases where uh, people sustained uh, serious concussions. So that wasn't specific to Portland? That was specific to Austin. That was yes. specific to Austin. Mm -hmm. Over what period of time? Uh, over a year. And how many rides total were there? Uh, I'm not entirely sure of how many rides total there are. I can get you the, uh, I can get you the report. Um, but the overall average was out of every hundred thousand rides, there were twenty accidents. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hundred thousand rides. Hundred thousand rides, twenty accidents. 
So it's not 20%? No. Okay. I, I just wanted to get clear on there. You said that other scooters lasted 28 days. I don't know if I heard that correctly. The Louisville, Kentucky study that used uh, BIRD's public data um, uh, suggested that their scooters were lasting on average 28 days. So what does it mean to last 28 days? Does that mean that it hits a mechanical failure, the battery um, lost its charge? Yeah, that they're breaking down uh, okay. among that time frame. And our, is it uh, customary to have an inspection program with these sort of devices? I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, we inspect them regularly. In any, in any area that we're in, um, any time that we're touching a scooter, swapping a battery, rebalancing it, and it has any minor mechanical problem, uh, we're, bring, we're either fixing it there on the spot or bringing it in to be fixed. Okay. And so not that you know of, cities don't typically require any sort of inspection? Not to my knowledge, okay. no. And then what other communities are you, have you already deployed um, e-scooters? Uh, we've deployed in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, Tallahass Tallahassee, Florida, uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Let's see, what else? Uh, I think we might be in Austin now. We weren't at the time of the Austin CDC study. Okay. And is this all in the last 12 months or? Yes. Okay. Is it in the last six months? Okay. Thank you. I would follow up on Charlie's question. The cities that you did roll it out in, were there detailed ordinances and regulations in place when you did that? The regulations change from city to city. Right. Uh, sometimes they have to do with uh, areas of operation. Sometimes they have to do with uh, operational timelines. For instance, um, Chicago is a pilot program. Uh, in Chicago, there are 10 companies who all have 200 scooters, and uh, they've got a specific amount of time um, that they can operate before the pilot program is finished. And once the pilot program is finished, it's questionable as to whether or not uh, the scooter program will continue. Um, uh, s sometimes cities put up um, operational restrictions saying um, that, say in Tallahassee, uh, every scooter company has to rebalance all of their fleet back to deployment zones every morning, um, where everything is kind of reset every day. Uh, that's one of the operational guidelines that was put in place in one of the places where we operate. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's curfews. I would suggest, given the time we're running here, Nick, did you have more questions? I'm going to get some time. Okay. Um, thanks, Spencer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. We're open for public comment first, Thomas, and then we'll get to you guys. Public comment? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I am a little late. We should go through everybody first. Yeah. I apologize, Thomas. <laughs> I don't know if it'll get that high. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, since the time is kind of short, I'm going to save the numbers. Uh, my name is Thomas Robinson. I'm presenting today with my partner, Mark Johnson, um, also my lawyer. Um, I'm presenting on the behalf of myself and my company, Hawk Scooters, who will be a franchisee of Bird Scooter, um, who you all seem familiar with. Um, started in Santa Monica in 2017, for those who are not familiar with it. Um, it just has expanded um, throughout 60 cities over the country, um, including Europe, North America, um, Middle East, up until also um, being as close as Kansas City with birds operating. Um, me, myself, I will be operating owner of the fleet coming to Kansas. Um, I'm a former basketball player here, 2010, 2012. I'm still currently professional. Um, I'm also owner of multiple business ventures across the US throughout Los Angeles, Texas, Philadelphia, and um, also here in Kansas. With that being said, I plan to bring um, you know, our idea of strategy and structure with my company here to Lawrence. Um, we will be a fully insured company for employers and riders. 
Um, we also will have a consistent staff um, with our company. For this, we present to cut down on the issues of bikes being left in front of businesses, um, parking spots, being safety hazards for days, not getting attention. Um, we plan to hire a staff of locals and also um, current students throughout the university right now. We also feel that, you know, myself being a part of Kansas, this will give opportunities back to the kids here and locals for job opportunities. Um, let me see, sorry about that. Okay, so after, after being allowed, if allowed by you guys, we would then move to KU campus, where we also have an agreement with them, but based off you guys' guidelines given here today or down the road when you decide. Um, as I mentioned, I am a part of Kansas and Lawrence. Um, I'm a former Jayhawk, and I wanted to bring some type of excitement back you know, with transportation, but at the same time, a safe one. So um, we feel that no technology, which we have new technology in place I'll be bringing, can actually fix every problem, but we do believe putting some structure with our company will help things. Um, so in, we have no ride areas. Um, if you are in those areas, we do tend to find our riders um, for leaving bikes unparked correctly. With the new bikes and the new technology, um, the Arouse Acts, they do give a better parking directions or, you know, it's, it's a better, the technology I made it better for the business owners itself and for the riders to be able to park. You actually cannot lock the ride or finish the ride if it's not parked correctly with Bird. So um, that would be a, a main thing that we're trying to in place. Also, we will bring a call line that will be placed on every scooter here that we have under our company. So if your business or you personally are affected or interrupted by a vehicle, you can call this line. It will be operating through all hours of our uh, service. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the consistent staff that we have would be there to try to, you know, shorten these issues up. As I looked in the past, that's pretty much, you know, the, the complaint about these things. They're in the way, the safety hazards, um, it's pretty much not safe, basically. So what we plan to do is, you know, bring it into town, but bring it with structure and with a safety guideline that'll help everybody, you know, be happy. I think that's everything. I can take any questions. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. I am a uh, sole owner of this fleet. I am a personal investor of this fleet, and I also will be hands on with this fleet. I also do and agree to any pilot um, you guys may want to try with our company to test, seeing that we are not in any other city. Um, this will be started here, this will be homegrown here, and this will be something for Lawrence that we plan to succeed with and expand in the future. Thank you. I'll take any questions. No. So what technology do you use to ensure that bikes be parked in the right spot? Is it geofencing or do you have to take a picture of the scooter or the bike? Yes, yeah, so you have to take a picture. So you have to take a physical picture of the bike um, in its uh, correct position to actually lock your ride out. And if you don't, then you will continue to get charged, and I'm sure okay. everyone's not going to like that. And I should probably follow though. Uh, follow up on that. I've heard you say bike a couple times. Are you doing bikes I'm and, sorry, and I'm scooters? Sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, that, tell me. Okay. <laughs> it's scooters. Okay. Everything is sorry. Substitute bike for scooters. I will not be bringing uh, bikes to Lawrence. No worries. <laughs> Just making a check. How many, how many scooters are you talking about? Um, we're looking 50 to 100 scooters 50 to 100. max. Yes. And can you tell me how these, are they still charged by people taking them home? Yes. So, um, they kind of had like a free fall system in the past where they allow, you know, kind of the locals to come at a certain time of the day. But that's what's caused, we feel, has caused the disrespect to the businesses, um, the, the attention to detail of making sure they're parked back. Because you're not technically working for the company. You know, you're kind of on your own and it's extra money. For us, this is a job. Um, you will be demanded and taught how to park these bikes and also with our staff that's hired consistently the bikes will never sit for days and hours at all. We'll have consistent staff. Lawrence is so small that we can control, we can control, you know, our fleet, we feel. So, so you will hire people to take them yes. and charge them? Yes, we plan to, and we also have a designated area here where our bikes will be charged throughout the day. And we also have designated maintenance inside Lawrence where any mechanical issues we will be taken care of right on the spot. Could you stop a student from taking it? Like, I, I would not want students to take them into the residence halls to charge. Yes, if, um, if you guys create 
a no ride zone for us, then we could just, you know, put it right into the app and then it'll create that area not to be ridden in or the bike over in that area. And once again, also, along with not being parked correctly, if the bike is also out the area, the rider would be fined also. So we may have some up and downs in the beginning, but I'm pretty sure it'll tighten up really quickly. Well, I feel like this is a dumb question, but it's never bothered me before. But, uh, um, when you say a no ride zone, does that mean they won't work in, a, in that zone? Or? Yes, we will have the opportunity to shut bike down. Um, we control all our bikes through technology. So, it, it so we, can shut, we can shut the bike down if the area is for a no ride zone, yes. Okay, would that happen automatically or would you? Yes, automatically. So it just. And when you talk about speed limits, like on mass, same deal? The same bike thing. Go um, faster this, yes, the mass street is definitely a loophole we're still trying to go through. But as VRI mentioned um, earlier, we definitely will try to do a speed reduction if allowed on mass street. Um, that's the only street we kind of feel in town that's given a high safety uh, concern due to the parking that is on the street. And that's probably really the only reason why we think so. But everywhere else in the city, including campus, um, we think that the scooters should move pretty, you know, pretty decent throughout the town. Okay. I had, I had a question. Okay. And it, it's really for both. So you can you can keep people from leaving your zone, and can you keep? I mean, I, I these are, I'm assuming are going to be ridden in the streets. Can you keep people from riding on the sidewalk at Jefferson Street? See, that's where, okay, so. Uh, <laughs> can I get that? That's what I mentioned earlier. Um, I think with anything, you're going to have your knuckleheads. You're going to have the people who are kind of hard headed. Um, that's why we want to place a, a call line and things that you can kind of get directly to us so we can kind of get a grip on it before it becomes an everyday thing. We don't want kids coming down every day, uh, 30 scooters on Mass Street on the sidewalk and affecting things. So. Um, once again, uh, if you have an issue, or if the business here has an issue on Mass Street, they could contact us and then we will handle it from there. And like I said, um, everything that I'm in control of or have power will be, you know, ran with structure. So we will nip it in the butt. So it sounds, oh, sorry, that is another hand up on periphery. Um, so in that case, if you have a, a way that people can spot people who are violating the rules on the scooters, they could basically call into a hotline. Would it be possible to, to say something like, uh, so some person that was riding east on so-and-so drive on the sidewalk? Yes. I don't think that, that should happen. And you can maybe like track like who was riding at that time. Like that guy gets a fine right Yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Your email, okay. phone number, a whole identification process is required with, I think, most of these companies. Well, at least it is with Bird. So mm -hmm. we will then uh, proceed to contact them. And if there's too many complaints, then they will be suspended from our company. Um, I think... Companies such as Uber and Lyft, they have these rules. Um, if anything, misconduct happens, you know, you get suspended from the account. So we can't stop them from creating another account and, you know, backdooring us, but the credit card would no longer be able to be used with us if suspended. And so that would come from too many, you know, rules outside of the guidelines. So it sounds like then it would be handled internally with the company rather than if it's an actual violation of a city statute. I mean, could it be possible that that could be elevated to, you know, I guess, would there be enough evidence to give somebody a ticket if they were breaking a Lawrence law? Is that a possibility or is that kind of breaking new ground here? Yeah, I think we're going into a new ball game with That's that. Um, <laughs> but you guys make the rules and we're going to piggyback off that to make everybody happy. Okay. So our company will be based off the rules that you guys issue, um, seeing that, um, you know, we're not actually in town yet. So, um, we're literally going step by step with this, and this is this will be that. So I had a question, um, and it's really for both of you. But I think it was I was going to ask it later, but maybe now is good. Um, one of our considerations is uh, should e-scooters be allowed on sidewalks? One of the things I read in the report is that this seems to uh, appeal to a, a wider maybe group than the bike share bikes, and I was discussing this with my mom today, bike share bikes tend to be sort of one size fits all, which doesn't really work if you have like an eight year old or maybe even a 90 year old. Or, and uh, so what I was reading seems to, it seems to appeal to a sort of a wider range of ages, um, or at least that's what it sounded like from no. some of the. Um, Bird is 18 or older. 
18 or older? 18 or older, Okay, yes. that, that wasn't exactly my question, but <laughs> um, I mean, this is one of the considerations I'm having because I think my mom was like, well, that might be interesting to me if I could ride on the sidewalk. Um, but since one of the questions is, are they allowed on sidewalk, sidewalks or should they be allowed on sidewalks? Um, are the sidewalks, the only experience I have with scooters is just the ones that, you know, you ride on your own. Are the sidewalks in Lawrence even feasible, most of them? say in East Lawrence for an e-scooter, would you even be able to ride them on those sidewalks or would yeah. it not be? Yeah. I, I really? think if, oh my bad. Yeah, yeah, I think Have if, you seen them? Have you seen <laughs> the sidewalks before you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so I mean, they are small, but you know, I think people themselves don't want to hurt themselves purposely. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that, so um, all this has to play a part. Some type of human you know, knowledge has to play a part when you're on these scooters, so we cannot guarantee 100% non-injury you know, injury for anyone, but we will have the guidelines there to make sure you know, they're low. One thing that I'll add to that is that uh, kind of across the board, I think this is the case with Bird, and it's certainly the case with us. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, kind of across the board, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the case with Bird, and certainly the case with us, that the apps uh, advise users to um, to follow local regulations when when riding the scooters, and the local uh, local regulations would uh, suggest that scooters should not be ridden on sidewalks because bikes are supposed to be ridden in the street, and since they're treated just like a bike, then you should be riding the scooter in the street. So, the scooter the, or the sidewalk question is a little bit odd uh, because if people are riding on sidewalks, they shouldn't be. But who enforces that? I, I tend to be a, I advocate a lot for younger riders and so you know as a, as a mom who had an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old who was riding there were a lot of places that it was not really feasible for them to ride on the street we definitely didn't want them riding on the street they you know zigzag but we're talking 18 plus but what I'm wondering is why 18 plus and is that what you see everywhere so it's not like we have a safe route to school program so the, there's no option there for kids to be able to say use an e-scooter to get home or you know there's that's not a possibility then so it's basically KU students it, or that seems like who it's going to be the most appeal to in this situation when, um, well no to create an account you have to be 18 in order so if you supervise right. your child Great. to okay. be allowed to ride a scooter then you can initially start the okay. account and then they'll have access to yeah. use it that makes sense then, okay so if you feel your child is up to par riding scooters by themselves in certain areas then you know, then we, that's over to the parents okay. after that. Great. The one thing I will bring up, it's ordinance 17706, use of protective helmets. No person 15 years of age or younger shall ride a bicycle, wear, ride, or use any other roller skates and da, 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 scooters. They commonly defined within the city limits without properly wearing an approved skate or bicycle helmet skirt fastly by the chin strap. So there okay. is a requirement yep. for safety. Okay, I think we better move on. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Appreciate Appreciate it. It. How many people are thinking about public comment, just so I can try to... Okay, uh, let's start with the public comment, and let's try to do it in two to three minutes, each person, and we may be able to get through, and I'll, I'll try to facilitate that, so... Whoever's up first, step to the stand and introduce yourself. And for some reason, my clock broke, so I have to keep track of the time. Okay. I don't know what I am. And please sign in and state your name. Okay. Hi, my name is Tierra Floyd. Um, I'm the student body president at KU, and so I guess I'm just here um, speaking for KU students. Um, and given the comment made earlier about how it's not a competition, um, I guess now my statement is just kind of on a um, general basis and guideline, but I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. Um, as a student body president, I did have conversations with Spencer from Via Ride about continuing our relationship in bringing via ride specific e-scooters to campus. Um, but I do 
hope that you all create an ordinance that will allow e-scooters in Lawrence <coughs> and on the KU campus in general. Um, of course, going off of whatever you see fit for um, the regulations and guidelines best for the city and the campus, uh, mainly because when students want it, um, e-scooters will definitely create a more competitive environment for KU and Lawrence. Um, we're seeing a huge rise in e-scooter use within larger cities, spe specifically on the East Coast. So bringing them to the Midwest um, and being one of the first um, states slash cities in the Midwest to um, use these will definitely create kind of traffic towards KU and Lawrence and um, we'd all want that with more students and people here to show how great of a place it is. But also I think that students um, are a very specific demographic and that a lot of students, especially um, international students are coming here, possibly don't have a car or have a lot harder time to um, obtain driver's license and ways to get around campus in Lawrence. And so adding this micro mobility um, with whatever company or with, that or with whatever regulations you see fit um, will definitely bring a lot of benefit to campus um, and will have uh, a better way to get around campus as well. Lawrence campus is large within itself on Jayhawk Boulevard. I often find myself walking the full 10 minutes from one building to another. Um, so using an e-scooter um, will definitely help increase or decrease that time um, to get in between classes. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Michael Allman, speaking for Sustainability Action Network. Uh, we really need to do this if we're at all concerned about climate disruption. Petroleum use in the U.S. is about a third of the primary energy sources. About half of the vehicle trips in the United States are single occupancy vehicles. Lots of petroleum use, lots of climate warming. Um, I think the main issue that well, then not, I mean, one of the main issues that you're going to need to struggle with is conflict of modes of transportation, as these illustrations show. Um, definitely not having scooters on sidewalks. The speed differential is very dangerous. But by the same token, not in the street. The speed differential is very dangerous. The logical place is in the bike lane but the speed differential is very dangerous and the top illustration shows you, well, where's the bicyclist in the street? It's gonna be a difficult decision for you, particularly if you consider what about shared use paths. So right now, we may not have that level of conflict. We don't have that level of conflict with bicycles and pedestrians on the sidewalk now, but it will be. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Um, I would say, one of the things that you should address as a global issue that would, that would affect uh, the neighborhood traffic management program, it would affect um, any, any number of the programs that, this, that the city does, is get home rule op, um, right for us to control the speed limits of every motor vehicle of every mode of transportation. Right now the state limits you, limits the city, to nothing less than 20 miles an hour. We need to lower that so that we can control what the speed limits are, not rely on an app and a, a Byzantine mixture of streets and whatever and different speed limits. If we can control it locally, and we can, it just needs to be changed at the state level. So I don't want to take any more time, but thank you very thank much. You, Gary Weber, 907 Murrow Court. I'll be real brief. Um, these are coming. I appreciate these two companies coming before you and getting your permission before they just put their bike, their scooters out there. It's, uh, this is to be commended on their part and gives you time to plan for it and get ready for this coming, because it's coming. Um, 
safety is number one. That's going to be your big, big job. This uh, National League of Cities report points out very clearly that sidewalks and pedestrians and these scooters don't, don't go well together. They're three feet long. The deck is three feet long. It has 10-inch wheels. It's massive on a three or four-foot sidewalk. And it's massive on a multi-use path, for that matter. So it, the discrepancy in speed is too great for pedestrians. It's too dangerous to have it on the sidewalk on the edge. So it presents a, a, a danger to, to pedestrians. But it also, cars present a huge danger to it when it goes into the street. Because <coughs> then cars are not looking for this person standing up with no visible means of support, moving slowly along. It's, it's going to be real tough for a while, and, and you have a tough job ahead of you in putting forth the infrastructure and the regulations that will keep it relatively safe, but we're still going to have problems. It's unfortunate that this site, this NLC study, does not recommend helmets, does not re recommend you requiring helmets because this is used as kind of a spur of the moment thing for last mile, and so people don't have their helmets, and you can't provide one with the scooter. So it's a real unfortunate thing that we're not going to be able to require helmet use if, if that's your decision. Um, also got same thing coming with powered skateboards. Now these are little, they're two, two to three feet in length, and they have a truck with wheels instead of uh, wheels, axles, and a handlebar. They have a truck that swivels, and you ride them like a skateboard, but they have electric motor and a hand control. They're coming too. I saw one on Lawrence Streets two nights ago, a young kid riding one on Massachusetts Street. So those are coming too. You, you need to be considering them. It's not an e-scooter. It doesn't meet the e-scooter definition, but nonetheless, it's an electric conveyance and can go up to 15 miles an hour, and you're going to see it on your streets, and it doesn't belong on the sidewalks either. So big job ahead of you. Put your thinking caps on, and I don't envy your position. Thank you, Chair. Hi, I'm Addison Hinson, KU's Director of Internal Affairs for the Student Government, and I just wanted to talk about some of the benefits we could ascertain if we were to allow e-scooters to be used across Lawrence and on campus. So one big issue that campus kind of sees during the day because Jayhawk Boulevard is shut off is traffic along Naismith, 15th Street, and other roads on campus. This could be a, an effective way to decrease congestion. Referencing the VO ride study we actually saw, when many of those vehicles leave the road, if anything, it makes it easier for students to get to their classes, but it would also make it easier for KU buses to get to their destinations because it oftentimes causes issues around campus, which then leads to students being late to exams, lectures, and things like that, which could help students in many ways. It's also a relatively cheap option for many students. As referenced in the study, many users are under $30,000 level of income, and there's no license requirement, meaning that international students who might not be licensed to drive in the US could use this as a mode of transportation to quickly get to meetings on campus, lectures, and more efficiently just do what they need to do at KU. Along with that, it solves many of the parking issues. Although the Mass Street area has relatively good parking for many of the students, the parking on campus isn't necessarily the best outside of the parking garages. And even though those, even then, those are more expensive, whereas this offers a more cost-effective manner to get to your destination without having to foot the bill of parking constantly. Um, it would also offer student jobs, as the um, Bird Company discussed, which is something we always look to promote in any capacity. Uh, and students really want this. We went through the election cycle in April and we saw what the students' concerns were and what they wanted us to kind of bring to them next year. And something that students consistently were pulling out their phones to vote for our new student body president for were the e-scooters. They said that this is something they want to bring to campus and that they would actually utilize. I think a pilot program would be largely successful if it were to be used. Now, to kind of go over some of the concerns that were brought up, um, E-scooters coming into residence halls would probably not really be an issue because you constantly have at least two DAs manning that front desk and those entrances to even get them in the residence halls in the first place that could easily stop the student and even then just contact the company and tell them that they brought a scooter into the residence hall. Um, along with that, there's the sign, you can, the sign, you can put signs in the drop-off zones because there's areas where the bikes and the scooters are docked at the beginning of each day. So you could easily just direct students to make sure that they aren't taking them into <coughs> residence halls, aren't riding on the sidewalks or anything like that. Along with the fact that the scooters actually offer a more accessible option for students. I'm 5'3", and I struggle sometimes to use the bike share bikes because that's the minimum height on it. So <laughs> this is something that 
all students can easily use, along with the fact that these apps actually advise that you follow the laws and you have to sign a user agreement that you will follow ordinances or you can be fined. So this shouldn't really be that big of a concern. It's number 2.9 of the user agreement on the VeoRide app. It's something I regularly use and I've read through. It's also one of the first things that pops up whenever you even sign into the app if you don't go into that user agreement. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but could you wrap it up here for us, please? Yeah. And so I would just say overall, I've seen these used in the KC metro area because that's where I'm from. And we haven't really had many of the safety concerns that are consistently being voiced. It's an area I'm constantly in. It's something I constantly see. And I think we're largely overstating many of the concerns associated with e-scooters. Thank you. Madison, I don't think you signed in for the user. Um, I did. I'm the second sign in on the sheet. Uh, you signed in in advance. <laughs> yeah, I kind of mixed it up at first. Sorry. OK, any other public comment? Thanks, everybody. Back up here quickly for any final thoughts I do. or questions, whatever. Well, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, right now the bicycles can only be parked in certain areas. Um, you know, on campus, they can park in any bicycle rack, but off campus, there are very limited places that the bicycles can park. So if we're thinking about um, scooters, you know, where are we going to let scooters park and will Scooter. It's hard for the bike program to be successful because you can't really go to Dylan's or you can't go to, you know, drive right to your apartment. Um, it, I think along with accepting scooters, we'd have to look at a way to, to expand how they're used and how they can park. So, I mean, that's something we would have to work out, but they're very limited right now. Okay. And where, where, are we, where are we going with this? Yeah. Are we, does it go to city commission after this meeting? No, no, no. We've got, I think, like Gary pointed out, a long ways to go. Okay. And we've got a lot of ordinances. Pilot programs seem to make sense, but we're not even to that point yet. This so. Uh, maybe Chuck, I would say one thing, and I had some conversations with Charlie the last few days about, we seem to be focused on scooters, and we, I think we need to put everything in the bag, including the skateboards and, you know, any kind of PEV. I'm sure we're going to get used to the terminology here, but personal electronic vehicles. And if this is not comprehensively looked at, it's probably going to slow things down for the e-scooters, but I don't think you can have one without the other myself. So, Charlie, did I cover that okay? Well, go ahead. I mean, Tim. I kind of feel like we got to move forward quickly, mm -hmm. but um, we also got to be thoughtful about it. So, I don't know how we can do both. Maybe the pilot is a way to do that because it kind of allows us to make some progress quickly, but also kind of acknowledge that we're not certain about all the regulations that need to be in place. Um, the little bit I did to try to understand electronic skateboards, what I was left kind of coming up empty with was the safety of a user on a skateboard, um, primarily at night. So the scoot, I was just in Wichita last week and saw they just launched these scooters and um, people were all over the place with them. and. They have lights, uh, you know, all around, um, headlights in the front, had brake lights. It was just really clear in the e evening, like, yeah, people are out there on the road. Um, there were kids using them. There were people on the sidewalk, on the street. I'm not sure what the rules were, but um, I do know they were used. They were popular. So I think getting to the kind of the student concerns, like, these are definitely in demand, and we have to think about how do we accommodate that. The skateboard thing, we know from a previous uh, um, public comment, there's interest in that, and Gary um, brought it up again tonight. So that one, I just haven't found much. And I reached out to um, Luke Smith in response to an email he sent and just kind of asked him, what else can you learn or tell us about skateboards in particular, or the e-skateboard in particular? And I haven't, he hasn't really given me a lot. So the best I found was Scottsdale, Arizona. They passed, uh, they updated all their bike ordinances, I guess, a year ago, 
or maybe just six months. It was like late last year, and they included uh, rules about around electronic skateboards or motorized skateboards. So maybe that's a place to start. I don't know. I, mean, I think that's the pending thing. It seems to be the scooters. We got companies ready to do it. I don't know why private citizens wouldn't buy their own at the price point they are. So it seems like this is an area where people are going to learn how effective they are for getting themselves around town, and they're going to probably start buying them if it's easy enough and affordable for them. Or they'll just, you know, go share one that might cost them 30 bucks a month or something. So we clearly got to act on it. I have two sons in California. One lives in Malibu and the other one lives in Virginia Beach. And they both use scooters and they describe the ride as um, very, it gives you a freedom. Mm -hmm. You really feel free when you ride these scooters. They love it. On the other hand, when they're driving, they spit nickels every time they see one because <laughs> they swoop from sidewalks to turn lanes. They, they're totally unpredictable, kind of like ants. And the drivers get so angry that when they see a scooter unoccupied, they'll break it up, they'll throw it into a tree. They do all sorts of things because they get so angry with them. And we have just made a little bit of space for pedestrians, so I could see that's going to happen here too. Now, having said that, I think Lawrence is dodgy. I would love us to have these things, but I want to make sure they're safe. And we're already concerned about our streets being unsafe. We've got a lot of groundwork to do. I don't want these people getting hurt. Um, visibility, SUVs are getting larger. Pedestrians are dying. Pedestrians and cyclists are having problems because of it. And people on scooters are even less visible. So. I don't think we can do anything quickly. I just don't. We have too many safety concerns that we need to address. How does this fit in with KU? Uh, we have several visitors from KU. Mm -hmm. it, I think that KU would adopt whatever the city does. I, I do have concerns about West Go Beach. I have concerns about passing times when there are so many bodies walking every which way. You know, we protected the boulevard pretty much, so. I mean, I, we would really have to look at, at how they operate. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be uh, cautious of the idea that somehow we can stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, and I've had we really can't. Say they own so their we I don't can't. Want to stop bringing their own. So I think we have to be um, thoughtful, but also kind of a, kind of figure out quickly what to do to put it um, to make it as safe <laughs> as possible at this point in time, and continue to pursue how do we improve on that. You know, a lot of this is driver education. I think part of that is how do we get, make sure drivers are understanding what the rules of the road are. So, um, you know, uh, someone said earlier that bicycles aren't allowed on sidewalks. Well, in Lawrence, they're allowed on sidewalks. That's the law. You can't ride on the downtown sidewalks, but you can ride on every sidewalk in town by law on a, on a bicycle. So we got to perhaps think about, like, how is it that we think about the rules for all the different modes and if bicyclists are allowed on sidewalks, the public needs to be clear about that. If a scooter cannot be on a sidewalk, um, that needs to also be clear. Because it, it's certainly confusing already. And, mm -hmm. you know, the more we can do to help people understand what the rules are, I think most people like to comply. They just maybe don't know what the rules are. And we've talked about the need to involve law enforcement in some of our, you know, work. And so this feels like there's a, Acknowledgement of the reality of the situation, and then we have to do a lot of work. So, no easy answer, but we can't ignore it. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, after hearing everybody talk, I'm like, a um, pilot program seems to make a lot of sense, but a pilot program without any rules could be very chaotic, or not could be, would be chaotic. So, I'd probably ask you guys. Uh, if we are going to move this forward to consider a couple of things. One, how would we do a pilot program that wouldn't just freak the entire Lawrence community out on day one? And um, secondly, would this be some kind of, um, we haven't had very many subcommittees or smaller groups getting together since Complete Streets. And it might be an opportunity to move everything a lot quicker uh, 
if we did something like that. So if there were, and Chuck and Derek, you guys tell me, Derek, it'd be great if you could be a part of that, I think, personally. And, uh, but you guys can decide on the staff, you know. We also um, have the Multimodal Transportation yeah. Committee, and yeah. I think they would be ideal. We, we yeah. discuss a lot of these same issues okay. on mobility and micromobility. Okay, and I'm gonna look back at Jessica, too, because of the education component of this is, geez, you know, not let's just throw them out there and see what happens. So uh, there's a lot of stuff here that needs to happen pretty quickly. Are there any, any hands being raised for? I, I just want to say one thing I'd like to, um, I, that I would be concerned about is there was some discussion in the um, presentations about kind of regulating um, very specifically kind of the design of the vehicles. And given that this is a relatively new space, um, I guess I would be concerned about us putting that into, you know, pen and paper where it feels like, gosh, in another year, it could, the technology could continue to evolve. And so if there was a way to think about what are performance standards that are expected, and that might be um, around parking or other key concern areas, and so that might essentially um, be used to authorize or to, or to license or to take away a license of an operator. I'm curious if there's potential to have a franchise fee associated with something like this as a way to generate revenue to support the regulation of the um, operators. Um, I don't know what state law allows for that, but if uh, we have franchise fees for right to way access for other uh, I don't know if it'd be a franchise utilities, fee, but there could be a. Or maybe just well, surely a license. Right maybe it's just a license. But there's yeah. some way to say, here are the standards expected of these type of operators in our community. They're licensed and we have a way to, to monitor their performance against these standards. Right. And if there's a, you know, data that they're sharing, we could mo we can monitor that fairly easily. Um, violations might lead to fines, might lead to taking away the license. So that scheme seems like an appropriate way to think about how do we allow for this shared mobility service in our community that doesn't get out of hand um, and actually rely on them to, to present that data. I mean, I don't think that we should have to do a lot of that work. I mean, they want to succeed. We want them to succeed. Let's just figure it out together and ensure people are knowing what to expect from the people that are using those machines. Okay, I'm gonna ask our group quickly, do we want to have a committee focused on this? And I would tell you when we did Complete Streets, I believe we met like every two weeks for an hour. And there was people Obviously, people were doing some research on their own and preparing, but that's the kind of time commitment we're looking at. So, first question to the group is, do we want to do that or not? Feedback? I, I, yeah, I would appreciate that opportunity, actually. I don't okay. think we to focus the amount that we should focus on this with just monthly meetings right. with all the other topics that we have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I would also be interested in having, um, since KU has been clearly interested in this to have student representation on the committee. Okay. There's a lot of legwork that could probably happen if we enlisted their help. And well, my thought was, it'd be, if, Donna, sure. if this is something that you'd want to participate in, it would make sense. Yeah, and I yeah. can ask student leadership if they've got yeah. suggestions. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Charlie, are you raising your hand? It kind of sounds like you are. I'd be happy to help. Uh, I think we ought to be concerned about our quorum requirements and if we want to add that burden onto the um, staff, because if you hit a certain amount, then we have to, it has to be a public meeting. So I, I just want to be cautious about that. Yeah. But when we had the um, bike ped issues task force, we subdivided into committees. Um, you know, that was something we had to attend to. And, you know, any communication or meetings, we can't have um, so many of us available at once without giving public notice. and. Well, we had All three that, on so. complete streets. Yeah. I think that's so. how we kind of complied. Yeah. And then at yeah. any moment, the I was the chair then, so at any moment I can still attend without violating it. Oh, okay. So if we had, uh, if you were well, well interested in being on the committee um, or just being someone who could come if you wanted to, then three others of us I, I'll, could do that. I'll take the second chair on this, and I'd let 
three people. Um, so Donna, Charlie, and Nick. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think it works for somebody to be prepared and kind of be the chair of that committee. Um, to keep You're the people. vice chair, right? Of our it's mission. <laughs> I'm just saying. I think it's more facilitation than time spent. So yeah. do you accept Thanks, that? Thanks, <laughs> OK. I have to see this is study session. Yeah. So That's true. you want to bring it up? <laughs> Do that at your regular meeting. Okay. At the end. And just Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Well, we actually have one more item. If we're done with this one, we have one more item on the study session. Is that correct, Chuck? Well, no. We'll just to receive uh, the information that Derek provided. And oh, okay. The request from Bill Ride. And, okay. Um, one of the requests from Bill Ride was of the expanded. Um, Parking down area in the city of oh, Lawrence. That is correct. I didn't know if you wanted to present separately on that, or that's something we can discuss uh, offline yeah, at a different time. time How long will it take? Ten minutes. Mm. We can no, catch it another time. time. I think maybe we ought to we ought to adjourn this, and um, we'll try at six fifteen. To be up here ready to go for the for the next meeting. Right, Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks. What?
let's see if I can say this right. Um, welcome to the Multimodal Transportation Commission. Was that kind of close to what we've done here? <laughs> but we haven't gotten that commission in an ordinance form yet. Oh, we don't. But that's okay. Really? Welcome to what will be called the future <laughs> <laughs> Multimodal Transportation Commission. But uh, all these rules. But anyway, uh, welcome everybody. I don't know where everybody went, but. Uh, Gee, now we're down to the important people here, so, so uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, first item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the regular meeting minutes for July 1st. Any comments on those minutes? I'll take a motion. So moved by Commissioner Bryan and uh, seconded by uh, John. Uh, they are approved. On to the general public comment. I better vote on Oh, geez. <laughs> All those in favor say aye, raise your hand. Aye. 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 Sorry about that. OK, general public comment. Everybody knows the drill here. Public is allowed to speak to any items or issues that are not scheduled on the regular agenda. Public comment will not be received for staff items, commission items, or a calendar. Each person or organization will be limited to three minutes. As a general practice, the commission will not discuss, debate these items, nor will the commission make decisions on items presented at this time. Individuals are asked to come to the microphone, sign in, and state their name and address. Speakers should address all comments to the commission. Any public comment tonight? Let me clarify this. Is this only for items that are not on the agenda? Yes. And so with uh, both the Lawrence bike plan and the non-motorized uh, prioritization, there will be a time for general comments? There will be. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty, let's go ahead and move on to item number three, the Lawrence Bikes Plan. Our action will be to recommend approval of the Lawrence Bikes Plan or not. And we will receive, um, oh, it looks like uh, there's a note that comments were received during the public comment period, May 15th through June 14th. Ashley, it looks like this is yours. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ashley Myers, and I'm a transportation planner with the Lawrence Douglas County Metropolitan Planning Organization. And I'm here with Jessica to present the Lawrence Bikes Plan. Uh, this process started in May of 2018 and has come before you a couple of times since then. Actually, we first came before you in April of 2018 in order to get a representative of the Transportation Commission on the steering committee. So Catherine Schertz was your liaison during the process. And then we had a joint meeting with you all and the uh, MPO Bicycle Advisory Committee, BAC, in November. And then at the June 3rd study session, you received a presentation on the draft plan. So we are updating the plan for, mainly because we now have dedicated funding for bicycle and pedestrian projects. And we had all these different kinds of plans talking about bicycle and pedestrian you know, priorities, and so we wanted to have one unified vision for what we wanted to do with that dedicated funding. Uh, we formed a st steering committee out of the MPOBAC and the Transportation Commission Liaison, and we had two public engagement phases. Uh, the first one was in May to August of last year, and it was a survey and lots of open houses and mobile meetings where we talked about how comfortable people feel bicycling in Lawrence. And then the second one was from October to December, and that was, how can we make Bi Lawrence more bicycle friendly? It had a survey and an open house and some mobile meetings as well. And I'll talk about some of those results in a second. But why are we planning for bicycling? Well, there's several main points, but mainly the health aspect, environment, mobility, safety, and the economy. Bicycling helps with all of those. Um, and when we did our 21 mobile meetings, we took whiteboards around and we asked people to fill in the whiteboard, you know, I, li I bike because I like to bike X, Y, and Z. And it was really great to read through their responses. 
uh, especially the kids' responses, because many of them were all about how they like to feel the, the breeze on their face. And I think that's really true. I mean, that's a great part of bicycling is getting to feel the breeze when you're going along. So here's a couple of slides about some of the results that we heard. If you add together the light green and the dark green, that's people who agree with the statement. And so 71% of people said that they wish they could bike or they would bicycle more often if they felt they could do it safely. So that's 71% said that. And then the question was, should people, should the transportation network equally prioritize the needs of people who bicycle with other modes? And 75% of people agreed with that. And that's with almost 600 survey responses. So that's pretty telling that people want bicycling to be prioritized and have uh, facilities. Then we asked about uh, level of comfort on different forms of bike ways. And when you add together the dark green and the light green, again, you get the agree uh, number. And for the most part, when you go across the spectrum from the left, from no designated bicycle facilities to the right, uh, people feel more, feel more comfortable when there's something, a bikeway on the street, which makes sense. Um, and this concerned cyclist title here, uh, we asked people when they filled out the survey to identify what type of rider they are. And concerned cyclists are people who only bike on shared use paths and would like to bike more if they felt it was safer, and then also people who are not comfortable at all biking, but they would like to. And so we split up the data between all respondents and then the concerned cyclists, and the concerned cyclists was 38% uh, of our respondents. So this one is about uh, biking on commercial streets, and I think this one's very interesting because when you add together the dark green and the light green, uh, you get your agree or comfortable feeling. And when you go across the spectrum from no bicycle, no designated bicycle facilities to protected bike lanes, you go from 3% all the way to 84%. So people feel way more comfortable when there's uh, protected bikeways. So we are, have that in our plan. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. Mm -hmm. So the committee tried to, and the staff were trying to be very responsive to the output and the responses that we got from the public and the, the public engagement really to address at a high level the level of comfort and safety on the bikeway facilities we're building and not all bikeways are created equal. And so the committee really also was trying to work on other aspects and feedback we've gotten related to bicycle friendliness. And so, for example, one of the things we looked at when we set out to write our plan was a plan with SMART goals that are um, a a a measurable um, with a, you know set time frames um, and really start reporting some regular data to be able to track the performance of our city over time as we implement different projects and improvements um, to see what's happening. Um, and we broke those down into five vision and goal areas kind of related to the, the conversations we've had um, over time and that kind of nest within our long range transportation plan T2040. And you can see how kind of each of these sit um, in relationship to where we are now, um, but also where we envision ourselves being um, in that process. Um, the committee had a lot of uh, discussion about where is the appropriate place to be. Do you be incredibly visionary um, when you set these or do you try to be more realistic and achievable? And they recognize that although we would think that, we're, that some of these are ones we would be able to meet, they did feel that some of them are still um, visionary for us to start moving forward in progress. It's also hard for us to know because we don't have a lot of data points for some of these measures that we're starting to look at tracking in terms of access within a quarter mile to level of comfort three because that's something we just established as part of this process. So some of that can change. Um, we talked about ridership and how um, you know mode share can shift a lot by outside factors that are outside of our control of even how many miles a network we have but what happens with fuel prices? Um, and so we had some of those, that dialogue and those discussions when we tried to set reasonably achievable but also um, progressive goals working towards improving bicycle friendly, friendliness. 
Um, the plan also recognized that oftentimes we have a lot of planning documents and we have a lot of recommendations um, and it's not really clear who should be responsible for implementing different parts of the plan. So while there, it's more clear now that Tra Transportation Commission has established where the opportunities to build the bikeway network are, um, there are other categories under the, the E's, education, encouragement, engineering, enforcement, and evaluation that don't necessarily just pertain to building a network. Um, and we kind of set out, lay out here those recommendations and how they relate to implementing the plan goals um, and then kind of who the champions and partners are um, in those scenarios to kind of look towards that accountability as we start reporting on this plan for how we are looking towards implementing the plan. Um, and familiar again to you should be the priority network. Um, we have then established um, with conversations um, to the MPOBAC and many conversations about desiring um, more density in some of the networks, um, but recognizing also the need not to dilute too much a priority network because we know there's greater need than we're going to be able to accommodate with current funding probably in 10 or 20 years. Um, and so depending on how, the, you know, there's a lot of assumptions about how those splits get made and we have to do some new project um, cost assessments which will be coming out of after the approval of this plan for uh, future project selection. Um, but this is kind of the network. Um, there's a lot of network also that's underlying this where there's other opportunities hopefully to build besides standalone funding um, other parts of the bikeway network. Um, but this is, the, this is the MPOBAC final approved existing and planned network. Something new to this process, and we've mentioned it before, is the level of comfort. This is the current assessment. I'm gonna flip to the next screen which shows the chart of existing bikeway types by facility and also um, then the AADT and speeds. Um, I'm gonna flip to that, let you look at it for a second as I talk about this and then we'll flip back and you can look at some of the streets. Or was that slide not showing? All right, so we had a lot of conversation as we talked with the public and with the MPOBAC about where do we look to in terms of design attributes and where kind of people to give to quantify comfort. Um, and having that conversation in the plan because we don't have any future facilities selected for roadway types like we did in the previous plan. And so this is gonna be a new kind of, you know, we're gonna have to get comfortable with this um, idea of level of comfort helping select when we get into the design process and understand current existing environments of speed and volume on roadways to select appropriate um, facility types to understand kind of where you're at in that com comfort ma matrix. There can be some trade-off conversation then with price and design as you start thinking about how we start to think about wh what some of our current facilities we might have are and how they rank, and so I'll go back to that. Um, versus what we intend to put out, which is more comfortable facilities that serve more users, particularly those who told us they wish to cycle um, but can't because that's where we think we can grow um, the cycling populations. That will then work in context with the design guide. Um, you saw on the side of this, there's major separation, minor separation, and shared streets. Um, and so those kind of three categories have a matrix in the design guide um, to be able to have the conversation about um, where those facilities fit in line with what type of street or roadway you're redesigning or constructing. Um, and then there's all of the leading cutting edge design standards from NACTO and AASHTO um, in that design guide that helps build support and a visual preference um, kind of locally um, to help support the street design guidelines um, that that MSO has established as we look to developing streets. So I think their design criteria for street criteria says you can use NACTO. We're showing what that looks like in this matrix and what we're expecting and where it's appropriate based on speed and volume of roadways. Um, and you can kind of tell from our level of comfort, we have existing streets that are very uncomfortable with bikeways on them. Um, and so those are gonna be hard conversations I think we have to continue to have in the future 
Um, Wakarusa is a very popular example that continued to come up again and again in the, with the MPOBAC, um, where there currently is just a conventional striped bike lane that doesn't rate very high in level of comfort with facility type. And so as you're talking about designing facilities for more people to use, you have to look, I think, to see what's the appropriate facility type that will bring a level of comfort down and be an appropriate facility for that street to get a network that more people are going to feel comfortable using. And this plan hopes to help provide tools um, for you to be able to make those decisions. Um, we had many, Ashley mentioned, our two um, public engagement processes with meetings and surveys. We also, like many MPO processes, have a formal 30-day public comment period. Those comments were provided to you in the plan as well as um, the staff responses. Um, we drafted responses and let the MPOBAC respond to those, um, and they and they decided they made some edits to our original drafts and changes in that in that process. Um, and then what you saw today is a final uh, draft plan that they've approved, uh, or that they've recommended approval for. Um, and so we can talk about next steps of that. We're seeking today transportation commission approval um, and feedback to move forward this plan in the approval process. Um, on the MPO side, that will go to the MPO Technical Advisory Committee and the MPO Policy Board um, to be the officially adopted plan of the region. Um, so that's important when we're looking to go to KDOT for funding um, for projects, because KDOT looks for what the MPO, approved MPO plan is. Um, this plan then also, why we're seeking recommendation um, from you, is we'll go to the City Commission for them to accept this plan. Um, so it kind of serves those two channels of approval processes to be the plan um, approved in the city and in the region. I'd be happy to entertain, Ashley and I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Anyone want to start? Charlie, well, let's start at your end of the table here. <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased with the plan. I think you guys have done great work. And having watched kind of this over the several years now, um, I'm just really impressed with the amount of data that you've been able to bring to the decision making. And um, that's remarkable and I think uh, important to acknowledge. You know, you used to rely on a lot of consultants and I think building the capacity in-house to do this is, um, a tremendous step forward for our community. I don't have any questions. Aaron? I think it looks great. I do have the same one complaint, and I just have to throw it out there because it's just a disappointment. And we talked about visionary versus what's possible, and you know, and, and I'm still a little upset about the um, Atchison Greenway. <laughs> um, so just thinking about, you know, we have a, a group that is trying to increase uh, trail opportunities and, and that, when you think about biking through Lawrence and comfort levels and, and sort of an enjoyable experience, I just saw that Atchison Greenway connecting to that, that linear park that really uh, will theoretically extend to 15th Street, or sorry, Bob Billings Parkway. I've been here for a while. <laughs> um, uh, I, that's, that's my my only real disappointment, and maybe it's silly, but it just felt like a good visionary visionary thing to have, and sad to see it go. So. But for point of clarification, it's still in the plan. It's just not. Well, yeah. Is it? No, it's not. There's there's not a dot a I dotted line. Okay. You're talking about this here, right? Right, but that's along a roadway, and originally when we had, had we had planned it, it was okay. uh, through, the, through greenway. the greenway. You're right. We had extensive conversations about this. You can always this. put it back in. <laughs> 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 um, we did have way. conversations. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Here we we did have conversations <laughs> extensively, or, you know, about a lot of the networking in different parts of it, because the MPO BAC reviewed every comment that we received from the public, and there was pages of them about different attributes to put in and where they belong. Do they belong in primary or secondary or second or in just the a base network about that. 
Um, and they had a lot of a lot of challenging discussions because, of course, everybody has the connections they want. Of course, we the more high dollar the ones they were, if they're removed from roadways or under crossings, or yeah. the more context you add to the level of comfort um, in some of that. And so that's one I thought it, I thought it had, but I recalled incorrectly. I'm sorry um, that they chose to remove. So yeah. Yeah, there will that? be an and we didn't talk about it, but. One of the conversations we've had as part of this process, um, and the, um, so we, when we first started this process, we had a countywide plan. Um, and we've had this dialogue a little bit, but we, um, in, the, in halfway through the process, really decided that we needed to write a Lawrence plan, and we need to write a county, Eudora, Baldwin City, Lecompton plan, um, primarily because the track, the, the pace that Lawrence is moving is exceptionally different than some of the other communities in our region. And so to, to, re, to get us on a cycle where we can update this on a five-year cycle, where we would do this and a pedestrian plan in between um, a long-range plan year periods, um, that we wanted to be able to do that and to most easily do that, it seemed to be able to separate those and let everybody work at their own pace to do that. So this, will, this can be a conversation we have in another four years. So can I maybe give a little background just because of why I, I felt this way? Um, that was put on there, I think, in the Pedestrian Bicycle Issues Task Force, but it was kind of the result of visiting various places around, well, really around the world, but mostly looking at stuff in, that I've been to in the country. And I've seen places that all of their bike paths are sort of trail systems, and I thought that was great until you start looking at those places once enough people are riding and then it's too congested and there are too many people on these paths. <coughs> and I've been to places where all of their system is on roadways or maybe trail systems, but say they don't have underpasses or anything like that. An example is Madison, Wisconsin, because you can't have underpasses. It's the water tables right there. Um, they have a couple overpasses. But I looked at Lawrence and I saw like a lot of our facilities are roadway facilities. And um, I don't think that's all bad now. I mean, we have a lot of uncomfortable facilities, but this just looked like one option in town that is a trailway facility that was um, would be such an enjoyable ride. Such a like, you're with your family on a Saturday and you're like, hey, let's bike out to you know the wetlands or something. And that's that was kind of my thought behind it. But I recognized it it made most sense if you did that there, you would have to have an underpass. But there's already an underpass there but I'm not an engineer, so it could be, you know, $2 million or something. So, so I just had a background of, like, this was a very visionary thing in Lawrence that I just thought would be great. So I understand maybe why it went away, but I still, I'll still harp on it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Is this the extension of Lawrence Avenue to the to the uh, so south? So when I looked at it, when I saw it originally, um, Actually, when I thought about it originally, um, Orchard's Golf Course was for sale, and they couldn't sell it. <laughs> and so from Sunset School all the way to the, uh, basically the South Lawrence Traffic Way, if there had been a bike path there, uh, you could have gone from basically those elementary schools um, if, if the, um, it's a long story if that golf course had been turned into anything but a golf course. Um, you could have gone from where those schools are all the way to the South Lawrence traffic way on a bike without crossing a road. And that was, so when I started thinking about it, as I, it was as I was moving back to town, I knew a lot of underpasses, and I just saw it as one of the, one of the few places left in town where you could have some, something like that. Um, so, uh, Currently, there's the, you can see the green. There's a if you're, if you're on the page I'm on, there's a little trail that goes nowhere, and this is directly behind my neighborhood, so I'm pretty familiar with that area. But there's a trail that's a half mile long that to, to from my neighborhood you go get on the trail, you go down the trail, and you have to come back to you can't like circle around because there's no connection there. Um, but you could see how it could connect basically almost from one end of town where the loop is clear to the other end of town um, in a very, very comfortable facility type rather than something like castled, um, which is not 
a comfortable facility type, although not Which too is bad. Still a higher level of comfort because it's still right. a separated facility. Yes. Than, yes. 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 And it doesn't have Castle also doesn't have multiple uh, driveways in the way that some of the other uh, multi-use paths do. Mm -hmm. um, so I just still can't quite let go. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Well, thank you. <laughs> Take what we can, I guess. So we can't just put a little dash line in. <laughs> so one of the other conversations we had in relation to that specific network area is as you start to look at that Lawrence Avenue connection versus we're starting to think They're about money. Together. What's actually feasible? Yep. And when you start to look at within a half a mile of some place where we have a shared use path, which is yep. still at the higher level of comfort matrix, how do you justify adding a whole secondary network that's parallel mm -hmm. to one you're just built when you already don't have money to fund your entire network. So if you talk about equity and distribution of facility, then I think we started to have some of those conversations um, and wh what belongs on priority, what belongs on secondary, what belongs just in the network, what yeah. belongs, it's really not, you know, it's like. I think I would, have, I would have loved to see that be the priority network, but so much of that has been done recently for reasons of, I don't know, Road, I lower mean, probably, hanging yeah. fruit, I guess. Um, so, yeah. I, I get all that. So it's not, it's not so much a complaint, I guess, as a wish, <laughs> a, wish <laughs> a dream. <laughs> okay, thanks, Aaron. Yeah. John, I don't think I have anything to add. I think it's very well done. Okay, Donna. Um, as a concerned rider, it's really chicken. This gives me a lot of hope that I really could get on my bike and and drive to work before I retire. <laughs> um, so I was gonna ask how often are you gonna update it, but five years, it sounds like is what it is. Um, how do you measure ridership? Just out of curiosity, other than just a survey, how do you do it? So that ridership specifically, two ways. Um, the ridership that's mentioned specifically um, in the goal metrics, two ways, I guess, in this goal metrics, but there's three ways we measure it. Um, the first is the mode choice one, and that's all ACS, American Community Survey information. Um, and so that's why you see it's very statistical. It's got a margin of error. We get that information. Um, we can, as they shift the three-year ACS information, we get that information from the census. Um, the bike to school percentages are self-reported by children as part of our Safe Routes to School program. That information is available since 2014. Um, and that continues to be collected twice annually. Um, and so that's an average, uh, or it's a, is it fall or spring? Um, Do you remember? I think it might be fall. Okay. Oh, one. it says fall. Yeah. yeah, okay. So in terms of what we're looking at for percentages there, we also look at ridership when we do specific facilities construction, like before and after or mm -hmm. segment ridership through our annual bicycle and pedestrian counts. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember also your recently approved strategy for um, neighborhood traffic management also includes some bicycle and pedestrian counters, which we hope to be able to add to the mix to help us get 24 hour counts to help validate the methodology we use for our manual counts, where we just have volunteers go out and collect information and then project rates. Um, but that's kind of, those are the three different ways that we track ridership. In here, we intend to use two of those mm -hmm. as ways to track it for the plan performance. Okay, that makes sense. Carol. Carol. Mm -hmm. um, after our study session, I'm wondering how the bicycle plan is going to incorporate all these other modes of transportation that seem to be inviting themselves onto the bicycle paths. Um, how, how are bicycles going to survive with scooters, hoverboards, skateboards, whatever else is out there? Well, I think the bicycle plan does have a better framework for some of the other E's. First off, I think the bike plan wouldn't govern some of those modes. Those are gonna have to be governed either by if like the, the STO or whatever you establish for local ordinances related to how those operate. And I think we're gonna have to think about some of those things, but I do think the bike plan has a better framework for some of the education and enforcement, um, particularly some of the work that you've been doing over the last few years. That's gonna have to, that framework is gonna have to continue to be developed and those programs are gonna kinda have to continue to evolve to make sure they can accommodate all users. And in the future, who knows, maybe the MPO and pursues a process where we have, you know, 
PEV plan. You know, we the the whole bike share conversation was started um, based on the bike share feasibility study and that process um, that the MPO got competitive competitive planning grant funding to conduct and start the, that dialogue in our community. So I think that's going to have to be something that we continue to see what work you do. But if there needs to be additional work, planning work on that. Um, then we participate in that process. I don't have a lot to, to add to what, I've, what we've already heard here. I think it's a fantastic job. You ought to be proud of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're not looking for more work. But you know what would be really nice would be some really s simple software where you could put down a pen anywhere in Lawrence and put down another pin somewhere else and get a preferred path. Most um, comfortable. Yeah, most comfortable, whatever. Uh, I don't know what other kinds of, you know. Uh, I think the transit does that, but it probably doesn't yeah, categorize it, by comfort. It is something like that. But I don't know how hard that would be. But I often have people asking me, well, how do I get from here to here? And I. You know, I don't use the city bike, bike network a lot, but I kind of struggle through it. I know enough about what I've learned here, but it uh, might be kind of something to So our rideability map tries to do that, I think. Oh, does it? Um, but it's a paper document. Yeah. Um, one of the conversations we've had with the MPOBAC, they started to work on an update to that paper map before we started this plan. And as we got into it, we realized we're going to create this whole level of comfort matrix based on some data where that mm -hmm. map is based a lot, a little bit less on data and more on rider perception and opinions in terms of like they vetted it, they've ridden it. Mm -hmm. They kind of, we've used a methodology that was established um, through another federal process to, to, to create that. But we were like, well, what do we do? What, do? Are these the same thing? Can you use this because it's a planning level data? Does this can you use this the same way you can the rideability map? Um, we, we have that next on the plate for the MPOBAC to work on. And so we are also entertained with them app ideas. Um, there are some national apps now since the last time we've updated that that, are, that might be available to us. Of course, Google's kind of king in that, um, mm -hmm. although their process is kind of unclear to us mm -hmm. um, because we've gone in and manually edited stuff to have it reset and changed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what do you, how do you choose that versus MapQuest versus everything else? Um, but we are going to have those conversations uh, with the MPOBAC as we work to try to figure out what our next writability map looks like. Well, I'd say for people that aren't experienced in a bike network or on a bike, the mentality is going to be about, you know, almost a straight line to get from A to B, whereas on a bike you might have to go a little bit out of what may seem to be out of your way, but would actually save you time and be safer. And that's, you know, it would be nice to build some yeah. of that into it. So we have, this is the print copy of our map okay. if you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. We're very few copies left of it, but there's also this. The only unfortunate thing is you can't drop pins like what you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, but this is what we have available now, mm. if it's gonna load. So. Yeah, I. But it's not. But it's it. not every street, and it's not. Sure. I mean, there's sure. limitations sure. to this. Sure. Street, so. Okay. Any any other questions, comments for? I got one <clears throat> other thought. Um, kind of going off. <clears throat> next question. The data that's collected every year by the MPO <laughs> to do the actual counts is that. Those locations, do they, uh, I assume some of them correspond well with the priority network, but I'm kind of assuming, are there going to be some modifications of those locations to kind of bring some interesting thoughts so on, like, are these? So there's not any one set that we count every year. Okay. Um, there's some that we've counted back and forth over time. Um, we don't have the capacity because there's so many locations that people want to kind of understand what the data looks like there and because the volunteer effort is so extensive that really the counters are going to have to be the future, I think, of that um, to get the, that automated data where it's 24 hours. These are all the locations across the community that we've counted at and each on our interactive map, you can click on any of these locations um, and find the year that we counted and what the 
projected average daily trips for bike and ped together are. Is that part of the map? Yeah. Um, this is the in the plan. Well, actually, it is in the plan. It's in the plan. Yeah. Um, but this is also available on our website as an interactive map. Yeah. It's and in, uh, not a layer on the layer list. Though. No, it's not. No. Uh, no. It's a separate. I guess one. what I'd be just curious about is how does the demand model kind of, how does it look compared to actual counts? Um, and, you know, what does that mean in terms of where, we, where do we need to prioritize investments? We did this. Um, we looked at it at one point. You've asked this question before. I, you know, <laughs> it's a typical thing I would ask, right? Um, like, are we putting I'm, money where people are going to use it, and is that you know the better value than putting it where it looks like there should be demand in this theoretical model? Um, Let me just bring that back to you for your okay. information. I'll make sure you get that sent back out to everyone. But we can put. There's no reason why we can't put. Um, we have a different map of this where we symbolize all of these dots based on kind of a, like a color scheme okay. that we matched very similarly mm -hmm. to the bikeway demand. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we can send that back out. I'll have to, okay. I don't know that it's most updated. I, we, we talked about that. Is well, this, I think it's one of those, like, as we continue to yeah, this, that's not demand, that's not have demand, better though, data yeah, yeah. and get yeah. clear on you know, what's our goal? Mm -hmm. Our goal isn't to build where there's theoretical demand. It's to really build where there's the best chance of increasing ridership. So mm -hmm. how does that happen? You know, can we reflect on both the actual data? Um, there the appears to be a very a a correlation between right. the location where we observe higher bike counts and the locations where we've said that there, mm -hmm. our, our model has said there should be bike demand. I'm thinking a lot about the, where the, you know, this captures the Lawrence Loop. And so where there's a lot of potential demand versus actual use to be cur curious where there's most divergence on that. Because that might be something for us to, you know, look at more thoroughly. Like, um, it, it just seems interesting that along the east side where we have the higher demand, the loop is actually you know, one step below the highest demand. And I wonder how many folks are riding their bikes on that um, Burroughs Creek Trail, Haskell Rail Trail versus Mass Street and I think that's. You're talking about here. Let me just also pull it up for everybody to see what you're talking about. So the underlying colors are the mm -hmm. bike demand layer mm -hmm. that Charlie's talking about. It's, a mo it's our model. It's the same model. This one's updated, but it's the same concept and model that we use in non-motorized prioritization. Um, and so here there's five levels right, of scoring and that under the networks. The part that I keep coming back to, and I've been, brought this up before, is that 23rd Street, we've done, you know, we've made the clear link to the bike boulevard on 21st street and i'm just concerned about how do you get from there to the trail and it feels like right now you have to continue north and then you get up here but you might not want to go there you might want to be going further south and so then there's this uh, secondary route and i just i yeah. guess i go well is that really how would i do this you know i mean i'm just like if we were all on bikes going up there what would we do because I imagine we would want to get there. It'd be really Especially nice if you buy there's this property right here. And, uh, What's that? <laughs> there's some private property in there. We're like, yeah. oh, this would be a really good connection, just like Aaron's. Yeah, and I think that's, that's part where it's the challenge, you know. Yeah. But people are going to try to do this, and we've got to make sure it's found, find the safest way for them to, to do that. So, and I feel like that's a, that might be a higher priority than the plan acknowledges. And, but I don't know. Like, is there any data to support that, or is it just my hunch yeah so like if there was a count data around there it'd be but i don't know exactly where are people going yeah. you know are they taking that yellow path or are they doing something else yeah well and that yellow path is just local streets right now right but you know, that's, maybe that's yeah. the route that they sort of yeah. naturally prefer i would love to get data from the you know that whole discussion about via ride which we didn't have about where they park i mm -hmm. the exciting part was if we don't restrict where they park i'd be really curious where people go and where we start to, I mean, we don't have other data on actual bike demand data, so that would be actual bike data. 
where people were riding. I don't know how, how what else you can get for bait, for better data for that Strava area. Strava is the only other option people are using. Strava, there you go. Yeah. Like nationwide. Yeah, that's but it has a price tag to it. Yeah, that would that's the kind of data that would be nice to have. So, yeah. that's all I got. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Thanks. Thank you, and we can move on to public comment. Gary. No. Oh, okay. Michael um, has to come up. Though. Kudos. <laughs> kudos. Yeah. Um, as far as ridership goes, I, I think MSO, through the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, is buying equipment for uh, doing bicycle counts in real situations. Is that true? I think, yeah. So there's going to be some hard data that can be collected wherever we want to put the equipment. Um, and as far as a five-year update, well, doesn't it seem like that five-year update should include micro-mobility or maybe be called a micro-mobility plan? You know, bicycles, e-scooters, segways, and all of that. Um, and third and final, there is an opportunity that up for grabs that's um, within reach right now. It's actually part of the budget that Commissioner Payton was talking about of an underpass for the Naismith Valley Trail to go under 27th Street when the new bridge is built over the creek. And I you know, talked to Matt Bond about that actually and I'm not sure if he's considering that in the design, but go for it, I say. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Any other public public comment? Okay, it's back up here. Do we have any further discussion or comments? I, I think this is great, but it always frustrates me because I can, you know, see things and talk to people about how they're biking and and uh, so you always wonder what you're capturing exactly. I mean, I, this has been been great and it was great to look through, but. I mean, things like that, like the Atchison Greenway, like the, the best possible scenario, you know, we, I still feel like we think about cars and the best option for cars, and then we kind of plan our bike routes based on them. That's how it still feels to me. Um, but I think that's just where we're at. So I, I always love those visionary things. And I mean, the other comment I can make is now we've, We've got this um, 21st Street Bicycle Boulevard, uh, which is great and will be good. And I think, you know, you have a road like that for Bicycle Boulevard and you think about, I think that's space that PEVs could use also. So it's more room than a, uh, it's a different setup than a, than a multi-use path. So um, that to me would be the kind of thing I would imagine we would go more toward. Um, I do have to share the story. Um, because of this, my husband kind of got into it because he commutes a lot by bike. And he started checking out what the, the bike boulevard would be and suddenly realized that 22nd Street was a, a better place to bike and now only bikes on there. Um, so the, the, these are the kinds of things that I'm like, ah, oh, you know, you're late to the game then. <laughs> you mm -hmm. to, um, but, but those are the kinds of things that I'm always like, well, wait. Now I just, you know, it's it's just what do people use and, and do we capture the the major, the people who the, say bike everywhere and sometimes I'm just not so sure how we, you know. So I think it's great, but. You think <laughs> you'll forget about 22nd when the first, when the bike boulevard goes I, I am I am really excited to see about that. Um, I did the bike count at 21st in Iowa. This is another thing I thought about today. Um, maybe Jessica can give me input on that. Um, I did the bike count at 21st in Iowa several years ago and was a little shocked. I think I kind of wondered if that's why I got that location. I was a little shocked at how many people were crossing there. And I think it was only eight or 10 or something like that in a two hour time period, but eight people in two hours Damn crossing at 21st <laughs> street. And I'm like, oh, because it's, you know, it's you can't even drive. Mm -hmm. You can't even get your car across there. You can't, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's terrible. Yeah, crossing so, Iowa Street. Yeah. Iowa at 21st Street. Yes, crossing Iowa. Wow. It's it's terrifying. And so putting that um, bike boulevard there, that's kind of made me wonder. So we have the bike boulevard there, and I think we've talked about this before. And then we're going to have this beautiful, theoretically, I don't know, underpass at 19th. And so I'm kind of wondering how that behavior will change. I'm curious. Will people go to 19th, go into the underpass, and go down 21st? Or like those are the things I'm like, it's maybe a little mismatch, both really good, I think. But um, I'm just curious to see how that impacts how people behave there so you know I was reading something on strong towns about um, planning for in a lot of cities I think Lawrence actually does a pretty good job of this looking at what the behavior is and then trying to put something into place to allow people to have that behavior like a the mid block crossings or whatever Um, but sometimes I think you'll see trying to push behavior so uh, putting bushes and making people go one way or the other when they're just not going to because a straight line makes more sense. So that's one of those things. I'm like, well, how will that impact? I certainly don't want to cross Iowa 21st, but <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm kind of curious to see what happens there. How that uh, changes the number of people right. down or up. Right. So. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Any further comments? I think I've uh, brought this comment up before. When our bike paths go through residential neighborhoods, I think we have to be cautious because some cyclists are very aggressive. And we need to, I don't know, turn them into bike boulevards or something, but we should not just let it happen. Thank you. All righty. If there's nothing further, staff is um, asking for a recommendation for approval of the Lawrence Bikes Plan. I move to recommend approval of the Lawrence Bikes Plan. Second. Moved by Charlie and seconded by John. And I remember, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everyone. Um, Moving on to item number four, non-motorized project prioritization. Action, approve non-motorized project prioritization policy and recall the old policy. Jake Baldwin, Senior Project Engineer with Municipal Services and Operations. And I'm just going to summarize essentially the, uh, the four major changes we've got in the revised policy. Um, and, and these revisions are just attempts to address uh, the evolution of planning, citizen and commissioner issues we've had as well as uh, internal city process changes. And uh, the first of these major changes is one of those process changes from the city and that is that uh, the policy is going to remove the ADA ramp prioritization criteria from the policy and uh, you know that the ADA ramp budget line has been separated from the bike ped funding and is going to be a separately uh, managed program so that's the first major change then we move into the pedestrian criteria changes we've got three there the first being the priority networks have changed points to give higher points to projects without uh, sidewalks on one side of the street for all categories um, the pedestrian access has changed to assign cumulative points to each destination within the range. And uh, we've got a map showing the current and proposed heat, uh, the, the heat maps, current and uh, revised maps, and they're attached to the agenda. Um, and then uh, the third there for the pedestrian, pedestrian criteria changes are the, the safety roadway volumes and crossings have lowered the, the a- AADT and the stratified, been stratified across the points. Number three is our bikeway criteria changes. Priority uh, networks have been changed to recognize planned networks in the Lawrence Bikes Plan. The bikeway demand has added community service center parks and assigned priority points to bikeway by type to align with the new bikeway uh, demand model from the Lawrence Bikes Plan. And again, the map showing the current and proposed heat maps is attached. 
in the third in the in the bikes is also safety roadway volumes and crossings has lowered uh, the AADT and stratified across points and the fourth and last major change is our non-exclusive factors has been amended to include cultural social social and economic benefits um, <coughs> the, the staff is requesting that the Commission should recall TC 18001 or replace with TC 19001 However, we know this is the first time we've brought back the revised policy, so we're open to entertaining uh, revisions at this point and, and, and bringing the policy back if that's uh, the commission's wish. Are you all finished? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Questions, comments? Anybody? This one's been around for a while. <laughs> We've had a lot of discussion on this, so. Anything further to add before we do uh, public comment? So it sounds like there is a bit of a disagreement given this email in front of us on how to add these cumulative facilities that are within walking distance or biking distance, right? Do we consider this part of the public comment? Yeah. <coughs> do you want to talk about it more or <laughs> to explain it more? Because it sounds like, I mean, so I saw the edits from, I guess it was from LAN that was saying that we should have the cumulative effects basically of having more stuff closer by. But this particular email talks about maybe ranking those and that some are more important than, than others. So what made it into the final changes that we're supposed to be approving? So we literally got this email uh, like 30 a, minutes hours before ago, right? your study yeah. session. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the, only, the conversation we've had before is really we recognize that some de destinations have a higher propensity. It's, this is trying to recreate the bikeway demand idea, right, which is um, except for that pedestrian trips are shorter and they can happen in a lot of different, you know, different ways. Um, and ha this has a, kind of a different set of matrix when we're looking at pedestrian access. Um, and so this ex the existing ped access. Uh, The existing PED access map that was in your, just to look at, compare the differences between these two, because I think this is probably the largest change that will impact the most projects in terms of point-wise out of the change, that any of the changes that are in the proposed policy. Um, and so this was the previous, this is the existing, nope, this is bike. Nope, that's bad. Sorry, I'm looking at the thinking wrong thing. This is the existing 531 point scoring system that was in the, the current 28 or 20 year policy that was approved, adopted in 2018. This is looking at all of those destinations. This is what you asked to see at your study session based on the feedback you received um, from the neighborhood and from land that is accumulative points of all of the destinations added across the city, um, put on a scale um, in quintiles based on five to one. So there's a large difference when you're thinking about projects and scoring. Um, there's some concern um, that this removes some of the emphasis away from neighborhoods and access to stuff and puts it back to downtown and arterial streets, whether or not you want that to be the intention of what you're looking at. Um, in terms of how that's going to impact neighborhoods and projects in neighborhoods, which might be in conflict to your number one, which is network, where you say safe routes to school should, with sidewalks on either side, should be the highest. Now, if you think about that, a project, um, particularly Mike, Michael Kelly, and um, concerned about Langston um, Hughes. Th those any projects in that area whether or not I think most of those at least have sidewalks on one side of the street but now would not only get a score of one whereas before they maybe previously had some threes and fives that was more equitably distributed throughout neighborhoods rather than just cumulatively to where we think about demand this is really just thinking about what's your true priority in terms of what do you want the data to tell you is it buffered in relationship to some where they all have equal, right? Where they all have equal buffer from those distances? 
or do you want the location in the community where we think there is the biggest potential access to the most destinations to have the priority in funding? And then how does that conflict with what you've said for the pedestrian ones before in the top category of destination to be safe routes, arterial collector? And how does this maybe skew projects to arterials? I mean, you just want, you'll want to be thoughtful about those impacts as you think about what this demand is. What Michael's asking for is a completely third option, I think. And this, Mike, I'm going to have you come up and this is Micah Siebold. He's a, for, every, for those of you who don't know, he's our GIS coordinator mm -hmm. for the city. But Micah said it's feasible, what he's asking right. for. So I'm, I guess the first thing to think about is this section is a fourth or a little bit less than a fourth of the overall scoring uh, matrix. Um, of your total 20 right. one points. Right. So. Um, so he's asking to rank uh, <coughs> medical facilities, elementary schools, uh, you know, different levels of schools at different numbers. Um, and we could do that uh, as well as reducing the uh, distance, the walking distance that we're using. So um, right now everything that's within an eighth mile uh, of any of these destinations gets three, and if there's, uh, you know, multiple destinations nearby, then of course that adds up. Uh, we could do a scale of, I, I guess, 10 for medical facilities and down, 10 to one. Um, it just depends yeah, how detailed you want. Right, we could really get into, um, so get this into is kind of finer where I details. Think, yeah. I think as part of this conversation and what, um, Jake was saying is you have to decide how much more work you want to see in terms of where where do you feel comfortable in terms of saying here was what our priority should be do you want to do you want to like write to make the map look like what you think you want it to look like or do you do you know what I'm saying you can make the we can make a map that says probably almost anything like you know what I mean you can make that so it's it's about what is the, what is the intention of the policy supposed to be and how do you decide to visualize that um, and to score points rather than say oh this pro you know this project in or out and I think that's what you have to come to terms with before we start talking about what's the best methodology to do that yeah, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we should do public comment and then come back and discuss does that make sense to everybody so clarify, are we in public comment no <laughs> no so I would say questions specific to what, what's before us, okay. and um, I mean I sure. kind of have a few comments, okay. but I think I ought to say them. So if that works for everybody, mm -hmm. yeah. Nick. Yes. Okay. Okay. We will. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we will move on to public comment on this item. And we're still shooting for a three-minute drill here, so do your best. I will. I'll stick okay. to it. I'm Tressa Hill, 705 Tennessee Street. Thank you for giving me this time to speak, and thank you for taking the time and effort uh, to, to, to address making improvements to this policy. I have three suggestions. One is to test some outcomes, for you to test some outcomes. One is to make access to priority destinations as important as priority networks. And the third one is that safety is counted multiple times in this policy. So test some outcomes. I recommend each of you run two or three projects that you know through the draft policy and test the outcome for reasonableness. The safe crossing for 7th and Tennessee project that Ode West Lawrence presented to you uh, a year ago uh, is 11 points. So test a couple of projects you know and uh, compare them to that project and see if this policy produces what you want. Uh, second one is access to priority destinations is as important to access to priority networks. 
when trying to get to the bus, the library, and the pool, and the park. It's just as important as trying to get to the bike path. The last thing is that safety is counted multiple times in this policy. Safety is really important. Higher traffic counts reflect safety. Roads with 15,000 cars per day are more dangerous and get more points than roads with 7,500 cars per day. In section three, the safety section of the policy, it includes points for road volumes plus points for safety crossings based on road volumes. So it's counted twice. Most projects on your list are safety projects. Why isn't this section safety maximum of five points, not 10 points, but five points based on your car count? The way it looks now, the policy dis diminishes the priority of neighborhood projects in favor of projects on high volume traffic streets. I'm asking you to consider three suggestions. Test some project outcomes to see how this draft policy works for you. Make the points for network access equal to destination access and count safety once. That may be the solution that you're talking about here. I mean, your roads are high. Uh, anything over 7,500 cars is 10 points on a max of 21. Thank you. And could you give us your, I know you've been here several times. Could you give us your name and address? And on this list or again? Both. You Both. Can. I'm Tressa Hill, and I'm at 705 Tennessee. Thank you, Tressa. Thank you. Thank you. Public comments still open. Hi, uh, once again, I'm Michael Allman speaking for Sustainability Action Network. Um, the kinds of questions that were just discussed regarding pedestrian access uh, apply equally to bicycle access. Um, and yet there's a disparity in the, in the policy at this point between the two, and I'm not sure why. Um, in 2017, when I first brought up concerns that um, I, I, I initially discussed, you know, before 2017, that we need origin destination studies for bicycles. Destinations, primarily. Where are they going to go? What's the demand? Before we had heat maps. And so destinations, to me, just like in the pedestrian issue, is the key factor for a bikeway, for a bicyclist. Um, so when I brought it up in 2017, I mentioned that it should have public service centers. It wasn't in the policy at all, and now it is, and I appreciate that, although it's, it's called community service centers, and I think that's not quite as good. And I said it should be things like the library, the pool, um, parks, city hall, Douglas County Courthouse, um, the county public works office out in the southeast area, medical facilities. Those are the primary destinations, whereas right now it's listed as community service centers, parks, um, and okay, where are those? community service centers, retail employment centers. Um, that's not what I was asking for, and I'm not sure how that made it in there, but that doesn't reflect at all the kind of destinations that both the pedestrian advocates and I, Sustainability Action Network, has been emphasizing, you know, the service centers, the public centers, which include parks, but also all these buildings where people will be bicycling to. They're not necessarily going to bicycle to retail. 
where you have to be carrying a bunch of packages on a bicycle. Not necessarily. More likely, you're going to go to destinations on a bicycle when it's an entertainment thing or it's a public facility where you know, you're conducting business. You're not carrying loads of things. So I think the policy should, for the bikeways, should have the same thing that we have for pedestrians. Let's have this list. Schools, universities, retail, parks, public, government institutions, not products, that should be in the bikeway section all. That's right there. Great. That's the same consideration. Thanks, Michael. Thank and if that's done, I think it'll, it'll address that adequately. Good job on the timing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other public comment? Okay, here we go. Carol, we could start on your end of the table here, or we could start in the middle, but. What do you want me to start with? Any comments, questions, where it's, it's up here for discussion? I think the destination access is important. Whenever I'm walking or riding, I'm always destination oriented. And we should make sure that somehow that's reflected in our policy. Um, just to clarify, is the, the the revised sort of cumulative destination for the pedestrian prioritization is that what's in the current plan? Yes. Okay. Yes. The, okay. Then that's what I strongly support. I really like that that's been done to add. It's a. Uh, it's one of those things that I feel like can feed a virtuous cycle, where if you choose to live in a place that is developed with you know, efficient use of land and resources and already is kind of walkable, that should you know, ideally be rewarded with things that make that even more easy to do, you know, walk to places, bike to places, take transit, and ideally get other people to start thinking, oh, if those places have all the really nice kind of uh, amenities, maybe that's the kind of environment that I should be living in too. I do worry about equity issues because in larger cities that is a legitimate problem. I don't know if Lawrence has that issue because there are equally poor parts of town that are auto-oriented and that are multimodal. And the same goes for the rich parts of town. There are some very multimodal and some very auto-oriented spaces. So I would say in other places where you may worry about only rewarding walkable places, you would then only be rewarding rich parts of town, uh, you know, that would be an issue in maybe like D.C. or Boston, but I think it would probably be okay here, honestly. Um, it would be interesting to be proven otherwise with, you know, really strong data analysis, but my gut is that there, there is a reasonable chance that you could be in a walkable community even if you don't have a lot of money here. So um, I, don't, I don't know if it should be, so if I understand, Mrs. Hill, your, um, your uh, argument or your suggestion, it would be to make the see, priority destinations and priority network the same Six ranking. Points. They're only one point off right now. That would be fine. Um, counting safety once, I think, would, though it makes sense, I think, from a rational point of view, when you take five points away from what is now a 20-point ranking, all of a sudden it becomes now safety is one-third, destinations are one-third, priority is one-third, which means that if priority, des sorry, if priority destinations become one-third of the total ranking, and they're heavily weighted to places that are already walkable, it may be even too much of a skew towards already walkable places. And though, personally, I'd like to see that because I live in, in one of them, um, maybe baby steps, you know. Maybe we can start with at least moderately favoring walkable places, but not, you know, totally throwing the game to places that kind of have their networks together in a reasonable manner. Just my personal thoughts, but, um, I mean, I like where this is going for sure, and the fact that there is a document with the, with the matrix with defined values that we can look back on and actually rank in a quantitative way is awesome. So it's a, a place that a lot of other communities don't seem to be at yet. And I, I think the way that the biking priority is currently set up to networks instead of uh, destinations isn't the worst. I think. When it comes to biking, most people can cover significantly longer distances on their bikes than they can when they're walking. So when I bike, I bike to many places at once, and I mean, granted, I have 
panniers, panniers, whatever you call them on the back of your bike. So I can do my shopping. They're not too expensive to buy. When you're walking, it's it's a hike to get to multiple stops. Like if I wanted to go print something out and then have, have a bite to eat and then go watch a movie, that's an all-day affair. On a bike, I could do the same thing much quicker. So I think the network is a much more important component of biking than it is for pedestrian stuff. But again, just my personal thoughts. I don't know what you guys think about that. Totally. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, this heat map, this is the um, TC19. This is what, when you apply TC19, this is what the... Correct. So you've rescored projects. Okay. Well, we haven't rescored any projects. Those are the areas of what we score based on what the map looks like. Okay. I agree. And then um, the priority networks versus priority destinations. Priority networks is getting you to a system, getting you more towards... I'm, I'm confused about what the difference is. That's what it sounds like. I think when we first started having this conversation, the priority networks is the tie back to our adopted pedestrian plan, which is a network-based plan, which is looking at, you know, we have more needs across all of our entire network than we're ever going to be able to accommodate reasonably. So how do we start to create some high-level networks that we can funnel people to to make sure that we get some high-level connected access to getting people to that? So in that case, we said, in that plan, that plan says, safe routes to school are most important, and then arterial and collector. So that pedestrian networks tries to reflect that those projects along those networks should be given greater priority in funding. There was also a concern, though, that there could also be other projects, right? This is balancing two kind of different theories about what should be funded first, that there's also a lot of value in trying to fund, like, whether you call it access, pedestrian access to destinations or pedestrian demand, they count, they're showing you a little bit of different things because the bikeway one is different than the ped one in that the ped one only is looking at places where people go. The bikeway one is also looking at where people live because it has some density of housing in it, yeah. which reflects um, in that model that was originally built by our consultants, um, kind of where we envision demand, where you would have a more captive audience of higher density, so you should, that you should build network there. The PED one doesn't do that. The PED one is only looking at access to destinations, not necessarily or the higher density origins and destination, those higher density destinations. So they're, they, they're doing a little bit of different things. But, um, more focus on priority networks can also improve, des I mean, de destinations will get swept up in that. Maybe, maybe not. This so, is so confusing I think the example and why like you got the email today um, is if you look at particularly, um, okay, let's use maybe North Lawrence as an example. So this is how you previously maybe would have scored projects in North Lawrence. Okay, think about where you have an elementary school. Think about how that looks in terms of people trying to walk to destinations um, in those neighborhoods. I'm just a random example. Um, and then come down and look at how much less priority anything in that neighborhood is now given, skewed to an arterial or collector street, less around a school. So you have said in your first value when you're talking about priority network, you want to value safe routes, so they might get one, the highest level of points in one category. But then, if you look at destinations citywide, you, you're with this cumulative system. You're not. You're no longer looking at buffers and saying my equal opportunity to walk from my school to my house, which may be five blocks away. It's no longer the same in this matrix, right? You're saying we're really valuing as a city again the highest dense, the density of destinations mm -hmm. as the place where we should be doing projects first. I think one of our challenges with either of these is the priority we want is on is based more on the vulnerability of the pedestrian. But so when you think about young children walking to school, mm -hmm. then your priority is to make sure that's safe and that's those schools are located in neighborhoods. When you're looking at all these other destinations, 
there are so many of them that pull pedestrians of all ages. Right. So it feels like we have to be careful about which destinations are we considering the highest priority. Right. And that is where this gets hard. Because so, still different destinations will be a priori priority for different people. We will right. all rank mm -hmm. them different. So if we're if we can get past that to think about for which users is this destination critical and they're actually vulnerable. So that you know we're not planning for the bulk of us who might be able to safely navigate even in an unsafe environment. Right. I mean, if you have limited resources, you want to be able to somehow direct them to those places that are going to protect the people that are most likely to get, you know, injured or who we're going to be most sensitive to wanting to protect, which I think that's where the priority around safe routes was sure. pronounced in the original policy. And it gets um, maybe lost a bit with this. And that comment about the neighborhood, I mean, I think that because safe routes prioritizes schools and it those are located in neighborhoods that kind of had a de facto skewing toward neighborhoods. Whereas this is a little more traditional. It's sort of kind of acknowledging that there are actually more pedestrians in these high traffic areas. We need to make sure that's a safe place for them to cross streets and to get to these destinations. So there might be fewer children walking to schools, but we might care about children more than we care about a standard pedestrian who might be able to do that using their own good judgment. So, so if a pedestrian lives somewhere in the yellow area, the assumption is they want to walk to the red area. Well, that's the that's a long walk. The red area is where in our community wide the the top red area is the top fifth of number of destinations in that area based on that three, two, one points when they add them all up. That's how we then divided those over five. That's where the most number of people, that's the most destinations there. So if you're talking about where you would build network, if people were walking to the most, where you could capture the most destinations in those areas, it points, assigns points that way. It's not to say that anybody in the yellow wants to walk only to those loca locations in the red. It's saying citywide there's the most number of destinations in that area. So if we were to treat it like, like the safe routes to school, we would be more into activity centers in different parts of the city, like well, shopping centers, grocery stores. So the difference is this adds up all of those same points, but then it says based on that spread, here is the highest level of destinations in an area, as opposed to this previous one where you had where it had buffers around areas and then points. So if you're closer to school and closer to this, then you got in the five versus the three versus the ones. There's less, there's three ch classes of points here instead of five in this previous version you had. And one of the things we heard also is the desire to stratify some of the points more. Um, so if you want to go back to something else or have a conversation about something else, we can stratify points across something more if you want to value something over something. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of goes to the comment we received by via, via email from Mr. Kelly was that he's saying that not all those destinations are equal, whereas yeah. this assumes every destination basically has equal opportunity yeah. to compete against every other destination, and the most number of destinations is in red. Yeah. Well, there are the the highest concentration other than schools of pedestrians is obviously downtown, but that isn't a necessary destination. And I think that's what Mike is saying. Um, a necessary destination is Dillon's, a grocery store, a doctor's office. Well, but those types of destinations also exist in downtown. Mm -hmm. and but the, the people too. in the yellow area are not going to go downtown to get to them. But the people in the yellow area, there's a, a walk shed, I guess. Um, I mean, it's pretty much shown people tend to walk places that are within a half a mile of their house, and much beyond that, they tend to drive. So the people in the yellow area who are walking are probably walking as recreation around their neighborhood rather than, to, rather than going to a specific destination because they live far enough away from any sort of any of that, like a, even a school in a lot of these cases, that they're, they're not going to walk to their neighborhood center either 
they're not going to walk downtown, but they're not going to do either. Well, and in some of the neighborhoods, that's not so. Some people do walk for transportation, and they do walk to destinations. Uh, not just my neighborhood, there are other neighborhoods that do that. The older neighborhoods, the farther west you go, the less likely it is to happen. And I think that kind of that this kind of reflects that. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions about um, hold on. I might have to come back to it because I've now lost my train of thought. But uh, the safe routes to school data, I remember that there was a lot of it, but now I don't remember what it said. Mm -hmm. um, this is just to make a point. Is, do you know what schools had the highest um, walking or biking? How much, yeah. how, what the schools were that had the highest amount of? I, I mean, one that just jumps to mind is Cordley has a very high percentage of kids that are walking. Cordley, yeah. why? I think, you know, it's, complicated answer probably. I mean, it might have a lot to do with personal preference and where you choose to live and how you want to get around as a personal decision. I think what you're raising though is not every destination is equal. And in the safe routes work, it was really clear that there's a lot greater vulnerability for kids going to Quarterly because so many walk and they have to get across some difficult streets. So the attention to that seems like it's it's more significant. And we have to be judicious, judicious about a policy that kind of quantifies where we focus our resources. Right. Because so we can't, we got to acknowledge, like, this I, might be I a higher get to priority that. than yeah. a school that yeah. has fewer kids walking. Right. Has, so. Well, maybe. But I wanted to get to that because I feel like this gets out a lot of the concerns I had or a lot of the thoughts I had. And that if you have a town that is mostly built on the car, I mean, I always say it, you can bike in Lawrence much more easily they, than you can um, walk. I'm actually way more comfortable walking in Lawrence, but it's a big city. And in some of these areas, you're pretty far away from, say, the grocery store that you want to get to. But if you want to only, uh, if you want to, live here and not own a car. I always have said university place. Because <laughs> um, you have a hardware store, you have a grocery store, you have all, you have a high school, a middle school, and a, an elementary school. So if you are moving to Lawrence and your goal is to not own a car, you're generally not gonna move to West Lawrence. You know, I mean, you're generally not gonna move to my neighborhood. <laughs> um, unless your husband works on West Campus and you might move there and he can walk. Um, so I look at this, and this kind of got at some of the stuff I was getting at. And that is we have this town that's mostly built on the automobile. But a lot of the people that live in a certain area, like near downtown, have moved there because it is somewhat walkable. You can go to your dentist. You can, you know, I mean, that's actually why I picked a dentist downtown is because I could come downtown, go to the dentist, and do other things. So I think this kind of addresses that, but I think that we all agree that, I shouldn't talk for anybody else, but that, that schools in general are um, a priority. And I mean, I see this and I think, well, that kind of puts a damper on, on that. But maybe, maybe I agree with Mike's list a little bit. Um, maybe not the first one, because I think if you're going to medical facility and you have some sort of orthopedic issue, you're probably not going to walk there anyway, and they're far enough apart that I don't think that's a major destination. But I look at schools and I think, I think that area south of town where there are the four schools, like where my kids go, like the Sunflower Southwest, there are four schools there, and I think the bulk of the reason more kids don't walk to school is because parents don't think it's safe. So I think you could have a lot more there. So I think this misses something also. Mm -hmm. Is that making any sense? Yeah. So how can we say schools and can we do and that? Schools and this, putting schools at a higher. Yeah. Well, you, you said all the destinations right now are Counted equally, or 
Yeah, so this would okay. be basically schools, university buildings, public transit stops, neighborhood, community retail, parks, public attractions, public and government institutions, nonprofits, daycares, health clinics. That's all of the things you've asked us to consider. There's thousands, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's every one on that list. If it's within an eighth mile, it gets three points. If it's in a quarter mile, it gets two points. If it's in a half mile, it gets one point in the model. Mm -hmm. Then we divide those model categories and that scoring points into, into quintiles, and that's where you get your five, four, three, two, one. Because otherwise, like some of those de point destinations might score like 1,200 mm -hmm. based on adding three, two, one up. Mm -hmm. And so you divide that back out because remember, this is one of three categories, so you're keeping some equity in your point model mm -hmm. from destinations to networks to safety. So would it be possible to, yeah. <laughs> you could go from a linear scale to a logarithmic scale. <laughs> could I, could I yeah. kind of, I don't know if I'm gonna, where I'm going with this, but I'm gonna try. Um, to me, this can't be all things to all people. There's no way, statistically, whatever. And I look at this personally as more of a tool and a point of departure as, a po as opposed to, okay, well, that's a 15 and that's a 14, so meeting's over. Um, and I think that this provides whatever system you come up with will provide people like us a valuable tool to look more into the subjective aspects of the decisions we're making. And I can recall back, because we have used this now for a couple of years, and I know we came in with pretty long project lists with a bunch of numbers, and all the numbers were very close, and we had the kind of discussion about what makes the most sense, not who scored what and why. Now, I don't want to just, you know, throw the data out of the window or anything because I think it's, you know, I think it's very useful, but I think there would be a point, and I wouldn't be a to opposed to some tests, you know. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly where we go with that, and I've always been part of organizations where that say, God, let's try it, you know, and, and we'll find out if we've made the right decision or not. The thing that's frustrating to me about the, the public environment personally is how long it takes to change something, you know. So I'm kind of reluctant to just say, hey, let's get on with it and see, see what's going on here. But um, um, so I'm, yeah. you know, I'm I rambling here a little bit. I think it depends who you bit. ask. I mean, you try it and you're going to get scores to projects yeah. and then, it's if you live in one neighborhood and your projects no longer score versus how they scored in the old policy, you're gonna be upset. If your projects score better than they used to most score, people, you're gonna be happy. Most people come in here, there's a few people that are really good about bringing up safe routes. Like, heck with the numbers. Yeah. Where are the schools and how many, how many people get there and how do they get there? And that's gonna influence a decision about uh, putting something on a list to get funded or not or to be recommended. So I'm going to stand back, and if you guys want to figure out the numbers, be my guest. Um, uh, but I really think it's a good tool that will serve us well. And sorry to be repetition, I just don't know how you can do all things to all people and come up with and get you anything can. And that's a staff that makes us really nervous to start to give you a scored list of projects one way and a scored list of projects another way because then it's you start to think about I mean looking at this map you can see where the projects are and as we start to make it really personal when we do put a project number to it it gets personal um, and so when we try to talk about policy, we think, what's the value? Is the value vulnerable users in schools? Then how do we develop a tool that can provide you the best information for that? Is the value we want to build the best networks we can and fill projects in, in the densest, most de destination-oriented areas? Then let's score it that, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Because then it's the, back to the question of the list of projects, you know, or the, and honestly, you know, I, th I think about 7th and Tennessee a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we pointed out the, the, um, 
the uh, score that it got, which seemed a little, you know, gee, how, that, how did that happen? But I can tell you that we sat here and we told the neighborhood that that's going to be something we focus on and we understand it. How many, how many people don't drive by 7th and Tennessee or try to walk or get through that neighborhood? And that just seems, I don't go out west a lot, but that just seems like something I could care what the number is personally. It just seems like it ought to be a big deal um, and we ought to get it done. So, so I, I think this is pretty exciting just because I'm, <laughs> I've never been excited. I don't usually get that excited about <laughs> maps. Or, <laughs> but this is like, whoa, this is interesting. Just to see how, just to look at different ones and see how, how it changes things. Um, is for some reason really, really making um, into this. Uh, but I do, I mean, I agree completely. I think that this is a tool and it was kind of interesting to see what happened after, after it was approved a couple years ago. But it's like with this now, I feel like you can be more exact or it kind of gets at some of the It gets at maybe the difference in the land use patterns, um, the choices that have been made about how to build and where to build and what to build for. And so I get that it, it may be not, it, it may be slightly inequitable, but like if you're living out west and you don't have much, probably one of the bigger things is can your children get to school? Do you have to have two cars for them to get there? Does someone have to take them there? Can they, you know, uh, can they take the bus? I mean, that's that's one thing that we live. Now, my child can't take the bus because we live a quarter of a mile from the distance or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's one of the major factors. Can your child get to school? So it's like I, I kind of like this because it kind of got at one of the things I, I am interested in, but that is a, that's just me. Um, I don't live downtown though, and I think that's pretty important uh, for a couple reasons. And one is, that's what we got. That's I think culturally a really great thing that we have that not everybody has. Um, but I, I really don't like the shift in focus for schools. And so I feel like this, if we could see schools kind of slightly with more priority, mm -hmm. It would be, you know, an improvement. I don't know. I, it's great either way. I think it's. I was just thinking of another example. It's far off from my neighborhood because everyone knows where I live. Uh, Hy V is in the middle on Clinton Parkway. That's a large residential area. How many of those folks can walk to the store? I don't. <laughs> can't. Can't even cross the street. And that's not near any of our red blotches. Oh, that's a little orange blotch. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to. I have a few comments. Okay. Thoughts, suggestions. So um, I think it could be useful for us to take a look at a list of projects using this, just to help us more context on what would it really mean. Just from face value, it seems like the there's going to be fewer projects that are going to be in the red areas. And so I'd kind of be curious, like, is that two or three that we can knock out? And then we're into the orange? Or are we going to be so, you know, still drowning in things that are in the highest priority area? So just knowing the volume of projects and how they um, score would be useful for me. And then I think there's two ways we could maybe think about safe routes. We already made this conscious decision that we would think about bike and ped funding as two separate pots. So we could then make recommendations on how to spend that, you know, with just this kind of arbitrary, let's just split it down the middle. 
We could think about safe routes as another pot that kind of deserves its own space. And then say, are we demonstrating our commitment to that um, particular program, you know, at a high level just by saying, all right, this is the amount of, we want to recommend for this bucket versus that bucket versus that bucket. Another way to think about safe routes would be, let's look at this prioritization, pro this list of projects, and then just filter everything that relates to safe routes and see how those um, score against one another. And so that would kind of leave open-ended like how much money, but mm -hmm. it would at least say, let's look at that list because we, we do think it's important and we want to maybe take on a couple projects a year that would help us advance safe routes and still stay flexible about you know, how much that might cost. But maybe just seeing that list versus the big list might help us add some context. And then I am kind of curious how rolling back some of the destinations would impact the um, visualization. So the terms community services and community retail are in the um, proposed policy and maybe that's too broad. You know, when we first saw this a year ago, I think, Michael, you had kind of identified a few additional destinations that you thought were a high priority, and we've now kind of expanded it to maybe, a, maybe it's too far, like given every community service an equal stake, and maybe that's not the right way to take it. Maybe it's to be a little bit more careful about which are the priority destinations Really, it's like not necessarily low priority for people using them, but when it comes to spending money to try to improve those pedestrian environments, which are the highest priority destinations for that purpose? And maybe, maybe that changes the, you know, the size of the red. Maybe it gets smaller, um, or, or maybe we, you know, give another thing would be to prioritize schools differently. So, but anyway, those are my thoughts, and I, I feel like. We could still move forward, but then ask for the presentation of the projects as a way to add more context and even see them as separate lists to help us think about how do we not minimize maybe an important community priority. And we're going to probably look at this again a year from now. I mean, I think this is where <laughs> we're making a lot of progress to think about how we're using data to help clarify uh, how community decisions are made. And, you know, it's it's real, it, I think it's impressive that we're able to mm -hmm. put policy that kind of is using data to help give clear, transparent mm -hmm. um, decision making kind of to the public. Because otherwise we're just kind of, well, I like this one and it's in my neighborhood yeah. or something. So yeah. this feels a lot like yeah. a big step forward. Well, I, I didn't ask Chuck and staff about um, the timing for all of this and it seems to me like a lot of the budget stuff is going to be taken care of for next year in the next month or so. So I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is when would be the next point in time? Would it be springtime? Would it be well, that's when you'll want to be designing and building these projects. So you're going to be wanting to prioritize them like during this fall. So that so during Jay this fall and staff can get them this fall. Well, yeah, the budget will be approved to tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, in public. Okay. For 2020. Okay. And you'll have a budget. And then they're going to need to know pretty quick if you want to see anything built next year, what those priority Oh, projects so we are. haven't even done that yet for so 2020. Probably needs, probably needs to be coming up pretty soon, I would assume. I mean, <clears throat> we, we end up like this every year. <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody waits and waits and waits and come May, mm -hmm. here's the project we want now. It doesn't happen. And mm -hmm. then we're building them in the winter or the next year, and that's why you're still working on that C-109 because we couldn't get the projects out the door. We need, there's six months at least to get a project developed okay. like this. Well, what I'm hearing, I believe, is that September, October, maybe November is a time when we're going to be looking at lists and making recommendations for what gets built in 2020. Yeah. Is that right? No later. Therefore, um, would it be reasonable to 
based on the comments you've heard today to look at this in September with trying to incorporate maybe doing some project yeah. testing? Sure, I think so. I think I heard a couple things. Okay. One is maybe to add, do look at a third map that weights some things differently and or calls back some stuff. Yeah. Looking at the other two that we have, just the existing and proposed, and look at scores of projects for those three. I think we can do that in a table. You know, I, I do agree with you, Chairman. <laughs> and Jessica <laughs> said it too. I mean, we make that map look however you guys want. And, then you, <laughs> and there's always going to be someone that's got a different opinion, whether it's bike or pedestrian yep. or schools or shopping or... <laughs> I mean, everybody's going to have something different. The thing with that uh, Commissioner Bryan brought up was, you know, we're trying to take data and we're trying to be transparent about our selections. And while although this may be a tool <coughs> to the neighborhood that wants to light at 7 in Tennessee, if their number's 12 and Charlie's project is number 11, they want funded. And it doesn't matter how much we say this is a tool, um, if we're going to say this is, we're going to score everything, a 12 beats an 11. And so this this is not easy. I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, it's it's not easy. So. Well, I think if you can do we can what we talked about. come back with something about, like that, that gives you an ability to make a decision come back in, in September. September. Yeah. And I think the idea of test projects, okay. and not a lot of them, sure. you know, I don't know. Five or what if whatever. we just show yeah like Pardon I was me. gonna say choose the top yeah yeah what if we give you what used to be the top the first page on the top list yeah. in all yeah. three models yeah. or something like that where it would be what used to score on the top and how it changed so you can see yeah. right I, well, I mean or I can we can do it however. I have a question I mean, on I'm, procedure if you want to do I, them all when you're on the model yes, you just run yeah, so once once the decision rules are figured out they are part of the overall decision is that right they're or they part are of the decision. process so staff then will take that list after you set funding splits and take that prioritization list and list of projects and we'll come back with a program that matches the budget of splits like a proposal to you that then you can have a conversation about and make recommendations for that's okay. how it's previously okay so done. once the decision rules are made isn't the wheels aren't greased and it's off to production. It's Staff co still comes back with a proposed list okay. of projects that you get to separately have a conversation and discuss. And at that point in time, you can say, oh, this project costs 50,000, but we really don't wanna do this project. We wanna do this other project that costs 50,000. Mm -hmm. Once you get to that place though, it's a little bit hard, more challenging, right? Because you gotta balance the, but you can't just select projects. Mm -hmm. You gotta balance the budget too, right? It's all those external factors. Oh yeah, we're doing work already in this area. So if we do this too, we mobilize. You know what I mean? There's some of those things that staff brings back in that proposal. Um, how often okay. does this get updated again? <laughs> well, <it's totally laughs> well, so it's a new policy. <laughs> Somebody so, says that's, every year, but it's not. Well, right. no, we've, it was created last <laughs> year, and so this is the. So kind of who knows. It's right? the first time. So okay. Yeah. So, take a look at it. So I, I mean, it's a conversation I think we're going to have to continue to have as our process evolves, as our values okay. change, as the funding so situation yeah. maybe changes, as we continue to do more planning. We're getting ready to go into a new safe routes to school planning process. There's conversations already mm -hmm. about how is some of the priorities going to change there in terms of not two sides, having a bigger network, one side doing. So I think we're just going to have to continue to make sure this gives us the best information as a tool for you to make decisions. Okay. Well, so there's no constant renewal process. Okay. So in that case, um, personally, I think it's perfect as is because the, um, it sounds like Safe Rats to School has kind of its own concerted effort. There is dedicated, I'm not sure if there's dedicated funding or not, but there's definitely dedicated stuff, it seems that people put in the dedicated focus. That's the nebulous term I was looking for. There's, it's not like there's a fund for Safe Rest of School, but people do care about it, it seems, more than other stuff. So I don't necessarily get worried that it's not outranking everything else. I think that this does prioritize places that are more efficient and productive in terms of land use, so I'm fine with it. And especially if there's no discrete updating period, who knows when we might have different information started over again, right? So, I mean, I'm okay with, with setting it in stone because 
that stone may not be around for another two years even. But since most other of the commissioners seem to um, would prefer some updates, may I suggest, if you're going to have four test cases for projects, maybe you could do a matrix of four and try two in lower income neighborhoods, two in higher income neighborhoods, and then of those two, have one of each that is in a walkable one and a not so walkable one. So say, example, you had one in North Lawrence and one in Prairie Park, maybe another one in New West Lawrence, and then another one in Old West Lawrence. I think that, that would cover pretty much the gamut of what we worry about with what the equity range and the walkability range. Just a thought. So, you know, you're raising a whole other consideration. <laughs> yeah. And that is, you know, adding a notion of is there a way to divide the city up and say that certain portions of the city should get something. Right now, this policy doesn't in any way do that. I mean, you know, this ranking looks to me like some places definitely would get stuff sooner than other places. But if you were to say, mm -hmm. all ranking, right, we're going to divide it up into four quadrants and ensure that each quadrant gets something. I wouldn't do quadrants you know. ge geographically. I want to mm -hmm. base it off of both income level and walkability level. And I think walkability level could basically be defined by what you're looking at here. I mean, there's an area level. of poverty in the lower left area of the city. Yeah, which is yellow. It's so, not, so, so that would be your not so walkable and yeah. lower income. But yeah. then you could get one in the exact opposite where you would have, you know, any mm. other combination of the <laughs> matrix of two by two, you know. We've already been through the ranking process. My suggestion is just use the ones that we already have that on that first sheet. When we run the model, it literally automatically scores every project. I can give you back every project under every I model right. I mean, that Just already, as easily, like Micah said, as giving you a list of them. We've already been through that process, so I, yeah. I think those yeah, those projects are there. So, you know, usually I save my comments till the end, but I actually had one on access to the library for all modes of transportation. I was in another meeting, and this gentleman was complaining because the bike racks that weren't pl were planned were never put up, and the ones that were put up were by a back door to the new fire station or some such thing. And so I started thinking about it. So I went on a field trip with my grandson. We took the bus downtown to the library and we got out, lots of buses down there, and I watched to see how we were going to cross the street. He's 11 years old. We've been working on this a lot this summer. And I said, well, technically you're supposed to walk up to the traffic light, cross the street, and down again. And I'm thinking, what a crock that is when we could have had a crosswalk mid-block. And then when I got to the top of that block, there was a sign that said the sidewalk was closed. And I thought, now what? But I could see that there wasn't anything there, and so we discussed it, and we continued down. And the, it actually needed to be closed by the library. If there had been a crosswalk there, that would have taken care of it. So we're not really looking at these things in a multimodal fashion. We were not looking at it for bus stops. We were not looking at it for pedestrians. We were not looking at it for cyclists. And now I'm hearing we're not looking at it because of the cars either. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we need to think a bigger picture with the destination. And did you also notice that a pedestrian does more than just walk? Sometimes they take the bus. So when you're counting trips, you can't just count how far they walk to the bus stop. You have to count where they went with the bus. It's, it's not as simple as we'd like to make it be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the issue. I mean, I'm even looking at this map again now. I looked at it this morning, looked at it when I got here, and I'm looking at it now and I'm like, I think I just saw what I wanted to see because I'm looking at it now and thinking about Lawrence and, and walkability and downtown's the most walkable. But if you look at the focus of this map, then you had already mentioned this, but I think I was just seeing the spot I wanted to see. The focus of, of making things more walkable would be Iowa, South Iowa. And that's not walkable, and it's going to be really hard to make it walkable. It's the, 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 uh, even if it's walking distance, it's still not walkable. So I understand how complicated this is. And I and I when I think when I talked to you about it before I, I I I knew all this. I mean you can kind of see how it might come out. So I guess my issue is 
It's like, yes, I want to see, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think that's where There's we go this, back to the community yeah. retail or community services, what is in there, and if that's scaled back somehow, this could look very different. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have two more examples. Uh, one is City Hall. Chuck loves it when I bring this one up. I've been saying it for years. For me to have access to City Hall, when I was able to drive it all, I liked the, the spot right across the street because it's all level getting across. But now I have my husband drop me off. So he pulls up in the right-hand lane, puts on his hazard lights, so that I can have access to the only door with an ADA button. And I, I don't know if he goes to North Lawrence after that or what. <laughs> but how are we planning our facilities that we don't take these things into consideration? Here's another one. Uh, parks and Rec courses at Rock Chalk. A lot of the courses were at Rock Chalk. My grandson wanted to take a computer course. So his mother takes off work, drives him from the southeast corner to the northwest corner and back, skips her lunch, and continues working. Why aren't we off, if, if we're really worried about equity, why don't we have a bus at South Park that picks up kids from the side of town, takes them there? Either that or why don't we have those computers in the library? where people can get to it by bus. We're really not thinking through these things very well. This is all transportation. Okay. Well, I kind of hear two different things here. I'm not sure if we want to move on with it now or if we want to come back in September. Um, I. Uh, I personally would, wouldn't mind revisiting some of the things in September with, you know, a real determination that we'll be moving on at that point. I think if timing-wise that works, then it would, wouldn't hurt to do that. Okay. Do you, you all need a motion for that, or is that pretty no, clear I, what I, we're I, up to? Um, Basically, we'll come back with some new scores. Uh, I think the sooner the better on getting this yeah. developed, so they, yeah. the staff can work on, you know, the projects for next year. Um, yeah. Because it has to, you know, it has to go to the city commission. Here's what we've done. Here's mm -hmm. what the transportation commission's recommended. Mm -hmm. You know, even before we start on this. So. Okay. 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 Good job. Good discussion. Do that. Uh, staff items. All right, we just wanted to give you a, again a brief update on the six hundred thousand dollars in allocation we've got from the two thousand nineteen CIP uh, project CIO nine, which is the sidewalk bike ped and AD improvements projects. Um, if we uh, go back to the recommended allocations and uh, on June third, again, you guys. Uh, uh, unanimously approved the 250,000 for the bicycle boulevards and 150,000 for safe routes to school phase two. <coughs> Previously, that item number one, um, we had uh, gotten approval from the city commission for two hundred thousand dollars for the 2018 <coughs> sidewalk gaps and 8A ramp projects. So that's the six hundred thousand dollars that was uh, received recommendation from the transportation commission. Moving forward, the city commission actually approved something slightly different. Um, the first, the $200,000 they had already approved, so we're dealing with that remaining $400,000. Again, previously we were saying $250,000 for bicycle boulevards, $150,000 for safe routes to school. Uh, the $150,000 for safe routes to school was approved by the City Commission, and that was on uh, July 2nd of this year. However, they uh, decided only to allocate $73,000 to the Bicycle Boulevards projects, funding only 21st Street and uh, delaying the 13th Street. And they also indicated they wanted to spend on the Lawrence Loop and allocated an additional $75,000 for the Loop on July 16th. So just wanted to give you an update that what we had uh, gotten a recommendation for and what was approved by the City Commission was slightly different. Um, also, in giving an update on uh, safe routes to school, did bid earlier this month, 
and we had some good news on that and that uh, we had about five hundred sixty five thousand dollars in available funding for the project uh, when we asked for the additional hundred fifty thousand we were hoping just to get the base bid and maybe a bid alternate and the bids came in low and we were actually able for planning on awarding next week both bid alternates with the base bid and we had a margin of about twenty four thousand dollars between the bid and what our available funding was. So that was really good news that we'll proceed with those projects. Um, and, and that's item number two on our remaining funds is we may be able to see a little bit of uh, uh, savings there to move forward into the 2020 projects for the prioritization policy. And then also we've got $102,000 difference between what was approved and what was budgeted. So that $102,000 will also be moved forward to help fund next year's prioritization projects. I'd be happy to ask any questions. I know I kind of zoomed through that. <laughs> but, uh, that makes sense. 126,000 that carries in the next year. Yes, it won't be additional funding, but will be used to fund next year's projects. Of this year's money? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I need to get back to the um, item we discussed in our study session about our subcommittee. Yes. And um, Donna suggested or uh, volunteered to be the chair. I voluntold. <laughs> voluntold. <laughs> okay. A new word. And Nick and Charlie. And uh, I think that would be great. And. Uh, uh, what do you need for that? Do Probably you? wouldn't hurt to have a motion and a second and a, okay. a vote that you want to set up the steering committee. Okay. For, yeah, steering, steering committee to okay. discuss pilot program. And okay. Well, let's get that motion and then talk <coughs> about the schedule. Who, who's up for the motion? Before we do that, can we decide what we want the outcome to be? Well, let's get the committee started and then we can have a little discussion. Okay. If that's okay. So moved. To appoint Charlie, Nick, and Donna, chairman of the committee for the, I don't know what you want to call it. <laughs> the um, PEV subcommittee. Sure. How's that sound? Uh, motion by John and second by Aaron. All in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And. Uh, What's the scope? Who, who is the second? I missed Pardon me? Okay, Aaron. Yes. Yes. Um, let's let's talk about the meeting schedule. It's going to work for you guys first before we get into any more detail. Donna, you you're the person that's going to be leading this group. Uh, what worked for you? Um, well, it's going to be after five, and really any any night of the week is fine with me. So it's. I think we can figure that out offline. Oh, you can. Uh, yeah, sure. we just email and. Okay. We'll keep, keep everybody advised then. Okay. That's there was um, one of the students who was here also no, the said she would be involved. The student body president. The other girl. I don't remember what, her, what her position um, is, but. Well, Judy. Addison Hansen. Hansen. Pardon me? Addison yeah. Hansen. Hansen. She's the student body president. Addison Hansen? No, she's, no, yeah. she's, she's, she's a liaison. In general affairs. student center. Okay. Hmm. Well, I. I um, Outcome, Carol, what is your question now? What do we want the committee to do? What, what is the purpose going to be? We're going to explore what a pilot would look like. Well, I think the first thing is to do that myself. That seems to me to be, the, you know, the thing to get this kicked off as quickly as possible. But with caution, like we said earlier, what does that look like? I mean, it's not like throwing a hundred e-scooters on the streets and seeing what happens. So the questions I would have would be um, who gets to, you know, if you select a group of people to test these e-scooters, what kind of training are they going to have? What kind of safety equipment are they going to have? What kind of direction are they going to have? Like. You know, you, you, there's got to be something like it's okay to be on a bike path or not. 
Is it okay to be on a street or not? Is it okay to be on a major arterial or not? <laughs> I think <laughs> like what are the rules of the game here? Rules and regulations mm -hmm. to yeah. govern a pilot program so that you can yeah. see. And obviously, the pilot what comes out of the pilot program may be other rules and regulations, mm -hmm. or yeah. some may not work. You know, mm -hmm. the helmet issue. I thought of that too, and I thought, how are you going to require that? Right. You if, can't, if you don't even have to have one for a motorcycle. Yeah. You don't have to have a motorcycle. Right. So. right. So. Well, I wouldn't require a helmet then. Right. Some I mean, people I just, may yeah. ask the question. But who brought it up? Derek. If they're under 15, city ordinance says you're supposed to wear them. Now, I don't think kids, yeah. all kids do, but. Right. Right. Um, so I, I think making sure we cover all the means of elect electric I, you know, vehicles. Wichita's just starting it. Um, there's yeah. several communities that David put in his thing. Yeah. So we can probably get some good rules and policies right. from them. Right. I do think Charlie brought up a good point, though, that <clears throat> these are easily obtained by individuals now. There, I know there are students so you're gonna, already that own them. It, it's oh, going to sure. be on the street, so you need to get it under control. I mean, I, I looked on Amazon while we were there. There were 15 of them under yeah. 400 bucks. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I can see my kids wanting them on their Christmas <laughs> list. I mean, when, once you see them, yeah. I mean, I was in Wichita, and there was a bunch, and I think they had just rolled out one of the operators, and they have a couple more lined up. As soon as people see it and get yeah. like, oh, wow, I want one, they won't bother to have to rent one or, you know, share one. It'll, it'll be, no, I want one. I mean, especially if you can afford it and, yeah. you know. I mean, I think if you have a it's problem with parking or where you're going to store it, mm -hmm. then maybe really? you just use a VO ride one. But if you can buy one, you'll probably do it. Well, I would think that that would be the kind of the mission of the subcommittee would be to look at a pilot program mm -hmm. and come up with a work plan as to what it looks like and uh, when it starts and how long it takes. Jessica? Did with respect to bringing it. As far as joining a, a partnership between KU and the city? No, they were wanting to renegotiate. I, I, I feel like that was separate, oh. and I think we just didn't have time to, to, get to, it. to talk about it. I guess it depends on whether you call it the PEV subcommittee or the micromobility subcommittee. Because, well, I, mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah. all of these are on wheels and reasonably quick and easy to access. Yeah. Some well, people are as on fast as a, a pedal bike as some people are yeah. on an e-bike, so I think. And also, the, it's, for the bikes, is the parking issue, which is going to be, we'll have a parking issue with scooters, so. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. huge mm -hmm. parking for bikes, but not for scooters. Right. And how do you, so I think, I, I think it's challenging to separate them. Yeah. When you look at the implications of how we manage the right-of-way and how we manage private property, what you're recommending the city do, those things are going to weigh in maybe the same or differently, but probably should be addressed. Is there any evaluation of the bike program? Additional data in terms of regarding how it's performed so far? Uh, anything. I mean, how, how is it working on our streets? I don't even know when I see one. How is it working? Are there complaints about the parking? There, there are, um, so on campus they can park in any bicycle rack, but they're not ending up necessarily in bike racks. We, uh, we know that there are areas that they end up I think a lot of them end up at a certain area because they can't go further. <laughs> They'll end up at the edge of campus because they're not allowed to end their ride, you know, at their apartment complex. So we get a collection of, you know, they'll do their ride up to that point and then leave it. Um, I think if there's any way to ease the parking, to, to let the system work where people really can take them to destinations, yeah. go do their shopping, bring it back. Um, right now they couldn't go to Dillon's and park it at Dillon's to shop. Um, so, I mean, I think that we just have to look at the whole thing holistically. I don't think the pedal bikes are doing terrific. I think um, they feel like they saturated, I mean, they just brought too many all at once. Appar the e-bikes are much more popular, um, and they're seeing a turnaround with the use of those. So I'm sh I know the scooters will be popular. And actually, this is the first, um, the student group, almost acts like it's hard fought that they got that they want scooters and they're going to get scooters 
because last year's administration didn't care at all about scooters. <laughs> they, they rode them in a demo. Actually, um, one of them thought it went too fast. He was nervous. He, it, he wasn't comfortable. So I don't know. I, this is a new group, and, and I can see where, where students are really interested in it. But I think his offer to take bikes away is good. We'll get some of those out of the mix and maybe cause less angst among neighbors. <laughs> Well, I was going to, I'm going to bring it up now. I was going to bring it up in the commission items because it's kind of a bridge, but um, I would personally like to try an e-bike. And I don't know if there are people up here that, you know, it seems like we ought to give it a whirl. We might learn from just a trip up and down Jayhawk Boulevard. Sure. And um, uh, so you if want, that's something. I, I don't, it, that's up to you, okay. I would say, but um, are there other people interested in doing that besides me? Because if not, I can just yeah, go get maybe. one. I, I'd, I'd enjoy doing it too. I mean, it's like when we did the transit thing. It's always yeah. good to get ourselves yeah. into yeah. what is it actually like to use a different, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I, I'm available anytime Saturday morning. It would be good okay. too, yeah. if that would work for folks. Just be careful. Um, don't exceed the farm. Unless you want to publicly announced. Well, we had a bike ride with our whole group. Yeah, it was last we'll year. It. We have to publish it. That's I mean, it's just well, that's rules. Okay, we so. can publish okay. it then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Jessica, did you have? No, you just have to publish it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If it's four or fewer of us, we do not. Or should be five. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Just publish it and we can, whoever shows up would be fine. And I would also consider looking at an e-scooter. I don't think I'd... I'll ride one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if we you could work... E -skateboard too? If we could work that in to this whole thing... Oh, sorry. I, what the I heck? Know. I wish they had brought a scooter. Huh? I wish they had brought a scooter. Yeah. To shift. I mean, I'd just like to look at one. I might ride it for 10 feet and fall over. But. Just to get an idea, who, who of us has actually ridden an e-bike before? No. I, I, I haven't either. Been on one. Have you ridden a scooter? That's my point. An e-scooter? Nope. No. Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> How about an e-skateboard? No. I can't even stand on a regular skateboard, but no, I'll need one. To... You have? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the point. Is It, yeah. it is you know, on us to, to at least try to experience these different things yeah. that are you know being yeah. used by people in our community. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. As the, as the one student pointed out, she can hardly ride the bikes because she's five foot three. I have the same problem. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. When we had the town hall a couple years ago and um, Topeka let us borrow our bike, I was like, great, I'm going to go out and ride it. And I went out in my neighborhood and was like, I, this thing is too big to ride. <laughs> so it was kind of yeah. Oh, yeah, really, really. I mean, as much as I saw those e-scooters in Wichita, they are going to take off. Really? I mean, yeah. I just... People stone. that are reluctant yeah. to get on bikes are mm -hmm. probably going to jump on yeah. a scooter. It just feels intuitive that you can get on one and mm -hmm. feel safer, I think, than yeah. well, I think I think it would be great if we could do both in this session, you know, okay. and, yeah. and have a look at them. And uh, yeah. I guess, I mean, we KU has a relationship with VO. We I mean, have, we we're not – I, I, I was actually a little awkward with how that went <laughs> because it – especially with some of the more – Competitive. Well, I think the kind pilot of program should be opened up, and we can see. Yeah. And you know, if the city <coughs> city decides to use a preferred vendor for a, the first year or something yeah. like that, that's fine. But I think initially we should probably see what both would come to the table and propose. Because okay. we don't need probably 500 scooters running around. Right. Right. Um, so one company would probably take care of it. But I'm not sure we need a hundred or a hundred and fifty either. Maybe mm -hmm. spend. Well, you gotta have enough rates. If they're spread around. Yeah, town. exactly. <laughs> no, we just need escalators or something on campus. I mean, these kids can't walk <laughs> ten minutes. Oh my gosh, no! It's a pretty sprawly <laughs> campus. Okay, I okay. think we've completed staff items and started commission items. Yeah. Um, Nick, do you have any updates? I do not. It's been a while since we've met. And okay. Things are still afoot with the transit hub, but nothing concrete has happened recently. I am in the meeting next week, so okay. next time we meet, I will have an update, but okay. it's been a while. Anybody else? I probably have a couple more items on my list. I uh, was asking myself after our last meeting, and I listened to the city commission meeting, if we did enough analysis for the city commission on bike boulevards. 
I'm not sure we were critical enough as far as, that was my first meeting, so I take it for what it's worth. It seems to me that we could have been more critical on the budget and more critical on the planning, but I don't know. I, I just brought that up. We, if we're here to help flesh things out before it gets to the city commission, we need to keep our decisions in mind. I mean, to be fair, I did try to tell them that you don't have to widen 19th and Louisiana to be an 11 foot turn lane, which would necessitate widening the road and moving the sidewalk and moving the utility pole. So I tried. <laughs> that would, probably could have saved a good $30,000, but nope. So, what are you going to do? And then I wanted to uh, share another little anecdote about neighborhoods, my neighborhood in this case, that's already multimodal. I was gardening one morning, 11 o'clock, and uh, an adult trike, a, a, a neighbor came by to show off her new adult trike. Her, she just got it in the mail. And then somebody went by on a hoverboard. <laughs> and a father, add that to the list. And a father <laughs> <laughs> walked by with his little four-year-old, and the four-year-old was singing Twinkle Little Star at the top of his little lungs. Hmm. And all of that just blended very well. But there was no pizza delivery truck. There was no FedEx. There was nothing else on the street. A couple of neighborhood cars, everybody was able to negotiate. To me, that's ideal. Whether or not we can achieve that, I don't know. <laughs> No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? I have one quick one, I promise. Um, it seems like kind of by nature we are involved in sustainability and climate control just by the nature of wanting to get people out of cars and walking and multimodaling around Lawrence. It was interesting to read Tom Marcus's article. Uh, Journal World did kind of an exit interview with Tom, and his comment was regarding sustainability and climate control in the environment that it's almost going to have to happen at a local level. It ain't going to happen where it is that way. Um, and uh, I do think that we, you know, by nature, that's what we're all about here. But my question is, and I don't have any answers, my question is, could this group be doing more? If so, what and how? Um, and I'm just throwing it out there. I think that we need to be thinking about stuff like this. And um, I, um, I, got, I get a lot of emails from the national groups, and I forget it was one of the bicycle um, the bicycle groups, I'm sorry, I can't come up with it right now, but there's a, a federal uh, a program that will assess environmental aspects of biking and walking and this kinds of transportation for future grants. So they're going to be essentially looking at cities that are doing these kinds of things if this passes, and who knows whether it will, uh, to get money. And uh, it just seems like we need to be, you know, visionary in some way, you know, to get our arms around this more than we do. And I'd probably say that includes us and many of the groups in the city. Um, lastly, I made the request a few times that I think it would be good to have a session with the Sustainability Advisory Board. I was, I was just thinking that. Is and you want to do with Jasmine? Yes. And okay. I think we've made that request several times, and, okay. and I think it would be a real valuable thing to do. I think they can offer us a lot of information, and we can also offer them. With the STAR program, there's all kinds of infrastructure and points for um, transportation and modality. And they're going to be better prepared to that when the time comes, and I know it's a couple years down the road if we have input on those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, that, Chuck, if that's a study session or, you know, however you guys think it would be good to put okay. that together, it would be. We'll have to see what Jasmine thing. thinks and what, I'm, I'm, there's definitely a link and we were okay. definitely, transportation was definitely part of the STAR stuff. And, right. Um, right. They've changed that to some other program now, yeah. but 
anyway, yep. Does Transportation 2040 have a chapter on the environment? Ooh, gee, I would hope so. The I'm, earlier it's ones probably did, but a, a layer through the whole thing. T2040 have an environmental chapter. Yes, but it, yes, but it's kind of weak. There's more in Plan 2040 to think about sustainability and environmental impacts. Um, Well, anyway, that, I wanted to throw that. I don't know if anybody yep. wants to add a note or two to that tonight or not. It's not important. But, uh, well, when I think of, I mean, I appreciate you keep bringing it up. And I think as we shift to consider ourselves as a multimodal transportation commission, we need to figure out how we're going to expand usage of transit to get to your point. Because mm -hmm. If there are more people and more cars, you're never going to cut down on emissions <clears throat> unless you were changing like the vehicle type, like electric vehicles perhaps. But the thing that's already in our community that could be the biggest uh, way to shift the mode would be that people use transit. And, you know, some communities don't have transit at all. We're fortunate to have, you know, a pretty good transit system, yet still most people don't use it. So how do we change that so that transit becomes a viable way to get around town? And that yeah. most people know how to use it, feel comfortable using it, and they choose to use it. Mm -hmm. One, Figure that out, I think we've nailed sustainability. I think you need a lasso. <laughs> and, I, and I think this is where, like, if we're really truly multimodal, then we've set targets around this, around mm -hmm. what is our mode split that we, that we aspire to see. And likely to get people out of their cars, you have to have better public transit. And maybe so, some disincentives to driving. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I mean, you're really opening up a big can of worms. If that's I another know, driver, right. a lot of our discussion has been about safety. And mm -hmm. safety doesn't maybe care so much about mm -hmm. sustainability. So maybe getting into land use a little bit. The, mm -hmm. the yeah. problem with uh, transit, and you can look anywhere. I mean, I hear people say, oh, we should have a light rail to Kansas City and you can mm. look in the country where they've done right light rail and it's where you have density. People aren't going to walk three miles to get to their work destination commute from Lawrence to Kansas City and it's the same way with uh, transit. Uh, we, we lived with my parents for four months before we bought our house and we lived way out west and I had to work, walk 0.9 mile to get to the bus stop. And I think I did it one time because as you walk two miles just to get to the bus stop when you have a car mm -hmm. and when you can afford one and you're just not going to get it. So, I mean, that's a land use thing. We've, we are a spread out city. So that's, go back to density. Uh, so since we were talking about some of this other stuff, um, I don't know. I mean, it's multifaceted. Your yeah, but uh, land use is kind of like talking about engineering. You can't, you, you can't stop there. You have to talk about education and encouragement and mm -hmm. all the other parts yeah. of how do you change human behavior. I mean, the design of the community matters, but also like creating the habit that people would even think or even first know how to take transit. Um, you know, I, I I keep telling my oldest daughter like, as soon as you learn how to take the bus, you'll get a phone. Mm -hmm. Like that's the key to a phone because mm -hmm. I don't need, if you don't, if you can get yourself around town, then I need to know where you're at and I need to be able to get a hold of you. So that's like the ticket to independence right. is the bus. And so if you, incentivizing if you, incentivizing video games. Not yet, but she'll go into sixth grade after next year, right? So then she's going to middle school. So then I think that's where I, I really believe middle schoolers need to know how to get around this community on a bus. Yeah, and yeah, so that just that, that feels like the right time to say it's it's time for you to become a little more independent, right. and you know I want you to be able to get around this town. Well, Charlie, so. wouldn't she say the same thing to you? What she wants you, the phone. You first. use the bus. <laughs> you no, you use the bus, or she'll take your phone. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, just think about how how did I teach her how to walk to school? Yeah. I had to talk. I had to take her to school. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's the same. The bus, the bus will be the same thing. Yeah. We'll have to start doing it. The hard well, part about teaching them to take the bus is to making them watch the time. They are yeah, not, time. That's they right. do not like to follow a schedule. Yeah. 
Well, I think this would be a great conversation to have with a nice, vibrant study session to talk about this. Well, that's coming up, isn't it? The uh, land use thing? It, I saw it on the schedule. Yeah, it's, it's coming up. In fact, yeah. Um, yeah, if it's okay, yeah. we'll table our conversation until then. And um, the calendar, Chuck, do you want to go through that? Yeah, so your next meeting's Monday, September 9th. Is that Monday, September 9th? Yep. Um, 5 p.m. study session, transportation and land use relationship, and then um, the regular meeting is 23rd Street planning study, and then we'll bring back the um, scores for the projects based on the new non-motorized prioritization policy proposal. Would it be possible in the study sessions to have slightly more time for discussion? It felt like in this one, mm -hmm. we were just kind of being talked at for a while, and we had maybe five minutes to actually discuss that. that. That's That's Oh, I mean, it was also a lot of presentations that were scheduled too. Yeah. So I mean, we should have yeah. we should have facilitated that. Yeah. That's, all That's good. a good point. Definitely. Would Who it be possible to... for staff, whoever puts the the uh, materials together, to index the PDF file so that you don't have to scroll through it? I know in Adobe Acrobat you can do that, where you have a table of contents and you just click. Oops. You know and more than me. And they do it for planning commissions, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have the planning department put the packet together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? No, no, the section. The planning department know. The different no, no, documents. Wait a minute. No more than 15 that. minutes so that you guys just talk about it. Is the planning no, department going to do the study works. session? Carol. I'll Land talk to you later. relationship? Yes. Yeah, is yeah that, I see it. She's got is that Scott or Jeff or do we know? I do know who. I do see it. Is that Jeff? Yeah. Okay. okay. The conversation everyone has had so far has been with Jeff Crick, who's our okay. planning oh. manager. Great. Look at that. Cool. Okay. Cool. Do we have to motion for something? All right. Yes. Is there a motion? I will motion that we adjourn the meeting. I second. Uh, yeah. Motion by, it's already there. Second by Carol to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Raise your aye. hand. Aye. Aye. Thanks. Um. Nailed it.